It was supposed to be a peaceful weekend getaway, a chance to escape the chaos of my job as a nurse and recharge in the solitude of a remote cottage. Nestled deep in the countryside, surrounded by nothing but trees and silence, it seemed like the perfect retreat. But on the second night, as I lay in bed listening to the soft patter of rain against the window, I heard it, a faint tapping, like someone tapping their fingernails against glass. At first, I dismissed it as just the sound of the rain, but when it persisted, I couldn't ignore it any longer. Curiosity mingled with apprehension, I dragged myself out of bed and made my way to the window. Peering out into the darkness, I half expected to see a branch tapping against the glass in the wind. But what I saw chilled me to the bone. There, illuminated by the dim light from inside, was a face, a pale, ghostly visage staring back at me with empty eyes. My heart leaped into my throat, and I stumbled back in shock, my mind racing with fear. For a moment, I stood frozen in place, unable to tear my eyes away from the haunting sight outside. But then, with trembling hands, I mustered up the courage to pull back the curtain and investigate. To my horror, there was nothing there, just the empty darkness of the night, the rain still falling steadily against the window pane. I blinked, convinced that I must have imagined it, but the memory of that chilling face lingered in my mind like a nightmare. Shaken but determined to prove to myself that it was just my imagination, I stepped outside into the cool night air. The rain soaked through my clothes, plastering my hair to my face, but I barely noticed as I scanned the area around the cottage for any sign of intruders. But aside from the rustle of the trees in the wind, there was nothing, no footsteps, no whispers, nothing to indicate that anyone else was there. I felt a surge of relief wash over me, convincing myself that I had just been spooked by the darkness and the rain. But as I turned to go back inside, I heard it again, the tapping, louder this time, more insistent. My blood turned to ice in my veins as I realized that the sound was coming from behind me, from the window of the cottage. Heart pounding, I slowly turned around, half expecting to see the face staring back at me once more. But to my relief and growing horror, there was nothing there, just the empty darkness of the cottage interior. With a sense of mounting dread, I crept closer to the window, my pulse pounding in my ears. And then, as I peered through the glass, I saw it, a figure lurking in the shadows, its features obscured by the darkness. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I stumbled back in shock, my mind racing with fear. Who, or what, was out there, watching me from the darkness? And why had they chosen me as their target? With trembling hands, I fumbled for my phone, desperate to call for help. But as I dialed 911, I realized with a sinking feeling that there was no signal out here in the wilderness, no way to reach the outside world for help. Panic rising in my chest, I stumbled backwards, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. Should I stay and confront whatever was out there, or should I flee into the night and hope to escape whatever horrors awaited me? In the end, instinct took over, and I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest as I fled into the darkness. The rain soaked through my clothes, stinging my eyes and obscuring my vision, but I didn't stop until I had reached the safety of the nearest town. To this day, I still don't know what, or who, was lurking outside the cottage in the woods. I was the town doctor in a small, close-knit community where everyone knew each other. It was a quiet place where nothing much ever happened, until one day, people started getting sick. At first, it was just a few isolated cases, a fever here, a cough there, nothing to be too concerned about. But then, more and more people started showing up at my clinic, their symptoms getting worse by the day. I did everything I could to treat them, prescribing antibiotics and bed rest, but nothing seemed to work. The illness spread like wildfire taking hold of the town and refusing to let go. I knew I had to do something to contain the outbreak before it spread any further. So, I reached out to the local health department and asked for their assistance. They arrived in town with a team of experts, armed with supplies and equipment to help us fight the epidemic. 
but as we worked tirelessly to treat the sick and contain the spread of the illness, I couldn't shake this nagging feeling that something wasn't right. The symptoms were unlike anything I had ever seen before. High fevers, severe coughing, and a strange rash that appeared on the skin. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, people started dying. It was like the illness was taking hold of them and refusing to let go, no matter what we did to try and stop it. I felt this overwhelming sense of despair wash over me as I realized that we were losing the battle against the epidemic, that it was only a matter of time before it wiped out the entire population. But then, one day, as I was going through the medical records of the deceased, I noticed something strange, they all had something in common. They had all visited the same place before falling ill, a nearby factory that had recently been shut down due to a series of accidents. I knew I had to investigate further, to find out if there was a connection between the factory and the outbreak. So, I went to the factory, accompanied by a team of experts from the health department. We searched the premises, looking for any clues that might shed light on the cause of the epidemic. And then, just when we were about to give up hope, we stumbled upon something that sent chills down my spine, a series of barrels containing toxic chemicals leaking their contents into the surrounding environment. I realized then that the factory was the source of the epidemic, that the toxic chemicals had contaminated the town's water supply and caused the outbreak. But as we continued to investigate, we uncovered something even more sinister. The factory had been deliberately leaking the chemicals into the water supply, as part of a larger scheme to cover up their illegal activities. I felt this surge of anger wash over me as I realized that innocent people had died because of the factory's negligence, that they had put profits over the lives of the townspeople. But we couldn't dwell on the past. We had to act fast to contain the outbreak and prevent any further loss of life. So, we worked tirelessly to clean up the contaminated water supply and treat those who had fallen ill. It was a long and difficult process, but slowly, we started to see progress. The number of new cases started to decline, and the people who had been sick began to recover. And then, finally, after weeks of hard work and dedication, we were able to declare the epidemic over. The town was saved, and the people could finally breathe a sigh of relief. It was supposed to be a bonding experience, just me and my son out in the wilderness, learning to fend for ourselves and reconnecting with nature. But as we set out on our camping trip, I could never have imagined the nightmare that awaited us in the depths of the forest. We started off strong, my son eager to learn and full of excitement at the prospect of spending time with his old man. We hiked through the woods, set up our campsite, and roasted marshmallows over the crackling fire as the sun dipped below the horizon. But then disaster struck. In the dead of night, a fierce storm descended upon us, tearing through the trees and sending torrents of rain cascading down upon our heads. In the chaos, we lost our way, the trail disappearing beneath our feet as we stumbled blindly through the darkness. Panic set in as we realized we were lost, alone in the wilderness with no way of finding our way back to civilization. But I knew I had to stay strong for my son, to protect him from whatever dangers lurked in the shadows. We pressed on, my heart pounding in my chest as we trudged through the underbrush, the eerie silence of the forest broken only by the sound of our footsteps and the distant rumble of thunder. I kept my son close, my hand tight around his, as we navigated the treacherous terrain. But then we heard it, the unmistakable sound of something moving through the undergrowth, something large and predatory stalking us through the darkness. I knew we were in danger, that we were being hunted by something far more dangerous than any wild animal. I pushed my son behind me, shielding him from whatever horrors lay ahead as we stumbled through the forest, desperate to find a way out. But no matter which direction we turned, we seemed only to get deeper and deeper into the heart of the woods, further away from safety with each passing moment. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, we stumbled upon a clearing in the forest, a small patch of moonlit ground surrounded by towering trees. 
It was our only chance, our only hope of escaping whatever nightmare had taken hold of us. I scooped up my son in my arms, his small frame trembling against mine as I sprinted towards the clearing, the sound of our pursuer hot on our heels. But just as we reached the safety of the open space, I felt something grab hold of my ankle, pulling me back into the darkness with a strength that defied belief. I fought with every ounce of strength I had, struggling against the unseen force that sought to drag me down into the depths of the forest. And then, just when it seemed like I couldn't hold on any longer, I felt my son's hand slip into mine, his small fingers intertwining with mine as he pulled me free from the grasp of whatever evil lurked in the shadows. Together, we stumbled out of the forest and into the safety of the open meadow, the first light of dawn breaking over the horizon as we collapsed onto the ground, exhausted but alive. We had survived the night, escaped the horrors of the forest, and emerged stronger than ever before. I was driving down this empty stretch of road in the dead of night, just trying to get home after a long day at work. The only thing keeping me company was the hum of the engine and the occasional flicker of the streetlights passing by. But then, out of nowhere, I saw it, a figure standing on the side of the road, illuminated by the glow of the headlights. It was tall and shadowy, with long, flowing robes that billowed in the wind. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized that it wasn't just some random person standing there, it was something else entirely, something unnatural. I tried to shake off the feeling of unease that was creeping over me, telling myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But deep down, I knew that something wasn't right. I sped up, trying to put some distance between me and the figure on the side of the road. But no matter how fast I went, it seemed like it was always right there behind me, just out of reach. I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw it, the figure still standing there on the side of the road, its eyes boring into mine with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. I tried to focus on the road ahead, to block out the fear that was threatening to consume me. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed, that there was something out there, lurking in the darkness, just waiting to strike. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I drove on, the fear gnawing at me like a relentless predator. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I saw it, the figure, standing in the middle of the road, blocking my path. I slammed on the brakes and skidded to a halt, my heart racing as I stared at the figure in disbelief. It was like something out of a nightmare, this spectral figure standing there in the darkness, its eyes glowing with an otherworldly light. I didn't know what to do. Should I try to drive around it? Or should I just sit there and wait for it to go away? But before I could make up my mind, the figure started to move, slowly, deliberately, like it was stalking its prey. I felt a surge of panic rising up inside me as it got closer and closer, its eyes locked on mine with a fierce intensity that sent chills down my spine. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, I heard a voice, a voice that cut through the darkness like a beacon of light. It was the voice of reason, urging me to stay calm and keep my wits about me. And as I listened to it, I felt this overwhelming sense of clarity wash over me. I knew then that I had to do something, that I couldn't just sit there and let this thing terrorize me any longer. So, with a newfound determination, I put the car in reverse and gunned the engine, speeding away from the figure with all the speed and force I could muster. I didn't stop until I was miles away safe and sound, with the figure nothing but a distant memory fading into the night. But even now, as I sit here writing this, I can't shake the feeling that it's still out there, waiting for me, biding its time until it can strike again. I don't know what it wants from me, or why it's chosen me as its target. But one thing's for sure, I won't rest easy until I know that it's gone for good, banished back to whatever dark corner of the world it came from. It was a quiet night, and I was on my usual shift as a paramedic, ready to respond to any emergency that came our way. 
The radio crackled to life with a call from dispatch, a report of a disturbance at a remote farmhouse on the outskirts of town. Without hesitation, I revved up the ambulance and raced to the scene, the darkness swallowing the road ahead as I drove. As I arrived, the farmhouse loomed ahead, isolated in the stillness of the night. My heart raced as I approached the front door, the sense of dread growing with each step. I pushed open the door and entered cautiously, calling out for anyone who might be in need of help. But there was no response, only silence that seemed to stretch on forever. As I made my way through the house, a sickening feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. And then, I found them, a family, slaughtered in their beds, their blood staining the sheets and the walls around them. Horror washed over me as I realized the magnitude of what had happened here. I stumbled back, my mind reeling with disbelief and fear. Who could have done this? And why? But there was no time to dwell on these questions. I had to focus on finding any survivors and getting them to safety. With trembling hands, I continued my search, checking every room of the farmhouse for any sign of life. But there was nothing, only the echoes of my own footsteps as I moved through the darkness. As I reached the last room, a sense of dread washed over me. I knew that I was about to uncover something terrible, something that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I pushed open the door and entered cautiously, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the darkness. And then, I saw him, a man, standing in the corner of the room, his eyes wild with madness. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I realized that the killer was still here, still lurking in the shadows. Without a word, the man lunged at me, his hands reaching out with a deadly intent. I dodged out of the way just in time, adrenaline coursing through my veins as I fought to defend myself. We struggled, grappling with each other in the darkness as the room seemed to close in around us. But I refused to give up, determined to stop this madman before he could harm anyone else. With a burst of strength, I managed to overpower him, pinning him to the ground as I called for backup on my radio. Minutes felt like hours as I waited for help to arrive, every second stretching out into eternity. But finally, I heard the sound of sirens approaching in the distance. Relief washed over me as the police burst into the room, taking the killer into custody and securing the scene. As I stepped out into the cool night air, I couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude that I had survived, that I had been able to stop the killer before it was too late. We were a group of friends, always looking for adventure and excitement, so when we heard about the abandoned mine rumored to be haunted, we knew we had to check it out. It was the perfect opportunity for a thrilling experience, or so we thought. As we approached the entrance to the mine, I couldn't shake this feeling of unease that settled in the pit of my stomach. The air felt heavy and oppressive, like there was something lurking in the shadows, watching our every move. But we were determined to press on, eager to uncover the secrets hidden within the depths of the mine. We descended into the darkness, our flashlights cutting through the blackness as we navigated the maze-like tunnels. The air was musty and stale, filled with the scent of damp earth and decay. As we explored deeper into the mine, I could feel this sense of dread building inside me, like we were treading on dangerous ground. And then, out of nowhere, we heard it, a low, guttural moan echoing through the tunnels, sending shivers down my spine. We all froze, exchanging nervous glances as we tried to figure out where the sound was coming from. But before we could make a move, we heard footsteps, slow and deliberate, like someone was stalking us from the shadows. I felt this surge of panic rising up inside me as I realized that we weren't alone in the mine. There was someone, or something, down there with us. We tried to stay calm, to tell ourselves that it was just our imagination playing tricks on us. But deep down, we knew that something wasn't right. As we continued to explore the tunnels, the feeling of unease only grew stronger. It was like the walls themselves were closing in on us, suffocating us with their darkness. And then, just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, 
we stumbled upon something that sent a chill down my spine. A pile of bones, scattered haphazardly across the floor. I felt this overwhelming sense of dread wash over me as I realized that we were standing in the presence of death. Someone, or something, had met a grisly end in these tunnels, and I didn't want to stick around to find out who, or what, was responsible. But before we could make our escape, we heard it again, that low, guttural moan, closer this time, like it was right on top of us. We turned to run, but it was too late. A figure emerged from the darkness, its features twisted and contorted into a grotesque mask of rage and pain. I felt my heart pounding in my chest as I realized that this was the source of the moans, a man, or what was left of one, driven mad by the darkness and isolation of the mine. He lunged at us, his hands outstretched and his eyes burning with madness. We scrambled to get away, tripping over ourselves in our haste to escape. But he was relentless, pursuing us through the tunnels with a single-minded determination that sent chills down my spine. I could hear my friends screaming behind me, their voices echoing off the walls as we raced through the darkness. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, we saw it, a faint glimmer of light up ahead, the entrance to the mine looming just beyond reach. We pushed ourselves to the limit, running faster than we ever had before as we made a desperate bid for freedom. And then, with one final burst of speed, we burst out into the open air gasping for breath as we collapsed on the ground, safe at last from the horrors of the mine. We stayed there for what felt like hours, catching our breath and trying to make sense of what had just happened. But deep down, we knew that we would never forget the terror of that night. I live in a shared apartment with my roommates, and this weekend, I found myself home alone. It's not unusual, my roommates often have plans or go out of town, leaving me to fend for myself. I was in the shower when it happened. The sound of water cascading down filled the bathroom, drowning out the world beyond the curtain. That's when I heard it, a whisper, soft and barely audible, coming from the other side of the bathroom door. At first, I thought it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, the sound of the water mingling with the silence of the apartment. But then I heard it again, my name, whispered in a voice that sent shivers down my spine. I froze, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end as I strained to listen. But the whispering had stopped, leaving nothing but the steady drumming of the shower to fill the silence. I tried to brush it off telling myself that it was just the creaks and groans of an old apartment building settling into the night. But deep down, I knew that something wasn't right. I hurried through my shower, my heart pounding in my chest as I stepped out onto the tiled floor. I listened intently, but there was nothing, no whispering, no sound of movement from beyond the bathroom door. I wrapped a towel around myself and tiptoed out into the hallway my senses on high alert as I scanned the dimly lit apartment for any sign of intruders. But everything seemed normal, the living room was empty, the lights casting long shadows across the floor as they flickered in the darkness. I tried to convince myself that I was just being paranoid, that there was no one else in the apartment with me. But as I made my way to my room, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the air. I locked the door behind me and climbed into bed, pulling the covers up tight around me as I tried to push the events of the evening out of my mind. But as I lay there in the darkness, my thoughts kept returning to the whispering in the bathroom. Who could it have been? And why were they calling my name? I tried to tell myself that it was just a prank, that one of my roommates was playing a trick on me. But deep down, I knew that it was something more sinister something that I couldn't explain away with logic or reason. I tossed and turned, unable to shake the feeling of dread that settled over me like a suffocating blanket. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind outside, sent a jolt of fear through me, and I found myself jumping at shadows in the darkness. But despite my fear, I eventually drifted off to sleep, the exhaustion of the day catching up with me at last. I woke with a start, the sound of footsteps echoing through the apartment. I lay there in the darkness, 
frozen with fear as I listened to the sound of someone moving around outside my room. I wanted to scream, to call out for help, but fear held me paralyzed, my voice stuck in my throat as I waited for whatever was out there to make its move. But then, just as suddenly as it had started, the footsteps stopped, replaced by an eerie silence that hung heavy in the air. I lay there for what felt like hours, too afraid to move, too afraid to even breathe as I waited for the dawn to break and chase away the darkness. And then, finally, as the first light of dawn filtered through the blinds, I summoned the courage to get out of bed and investigate. I crept out into the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest as I scanned the apartment for any sign of intruders. But there was nothing, no one hiding in the shadows, no sign of forced entry or foul play. It was as if the events of the night before had never happened, leaving me to wonder if it had all been just a nightmare. But deep down, I knew the truth, I had been targeted by someone, someone who had been watching me from the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I called the police and reported the incident, but without any evidence or witnesses, there was little they could do. We were a team of researchers, eager to uncover the truth behind an unsolved mystery that had haunted the local community for years. Armed with our equipment and a determination to get to the bottom of things, we ventured into the woods, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. As we trekked deeper into the forest, the air grew thick with tension, a palpable sense of unease hanging over us like a shroud. But we pressed on, driven by our curiosity and the promise of unraveling the secrets hidden within the trees. As the hours passed, we began to notice strange signs, a broken branch here, a trail of footprints there all pointing to something sinister lurking in the shadows. But we brushed off our concerns, chalking it up to nerves and the overactive imaginations of a group of researchers on edge. But then we stumbled upon it, a clearing in the woods, eerily silent and devoid of life. And in the center of the clearing, we found what we had been searching for, a makeshift grave, its contents long since decayed and forgotten. As we examined the site, a sense of dread washed over us, a feeling that we were treading on ground that was meant to remain undisturbed. But before we could make sense of what we had found, we heard it, the sound of rustling leaves and snapping twigs coming from the surrounding forest. We turned to see a group of figures emerging from the trees, their faces obscured by the darkness, their intentions unclear. We didn't know who they were or what they wanted, but we knew we had to get out of there, to escape before it was too late. We ran, our hearts pounding in our chests as we sprinted through the underbrush, the sounds of pursuit echoing in our ears. But no matter how fast we ran, we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that something was hunting us, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, we stumbled upon a hidden path leading deeper into the woods. With no other options left, we followed it, hoping against hope that it would lead us to safety. But as we journeyed deeper into the forest, the path grew darker and more treacherous, the trees looming overhead like silent sentinels. And just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, we heard the sound of voices ahead, the unmistakable sound of human laughter mingling with the rustle of leaves. We approached cautiously, our hearts pounding in our chests as we braced ourselves for whatever lay ahead. And then, as we emerged into a small clearing, we saw them, a group of locals gathered around a campfire, their faces filled with shock and disbelief at our sudden appearance. We explained our situation, our voices trembling with fear as we recounted our encounter with the mysterious figures in the woods. And to our relief, the locals offered to help us, to guide us back to safety and ensure that we made it out of the forest alive. Together, we made our way back to civilization, our minds reeling with the horrors we had witnessed in the woods. And as we parted ways with the locals, we couldn't help but feel grateful for their kindness and generosity, for saving us from a fate worse than death. But as we returned to our normal lives, the memory of our encounter in the woods lingered, a constant reminder of the dark secrets that lay hidden in the heart of the forest.
I was driving home from work, the road stretching out ahead of me in the fading light of dusk. As I rounded a bend, I saw a figure standing on the side of the road, their silhouette illuminated by the headlights of passing cars. At first, I thought nothing of it. Maybe they were just a stranded motorist in need of help, I thought to myself. But as I drew closer, I saw something glinting in their hand, a knife, or maybe something even worse. My heart raced in my chest as I realized what I was seeing. This person wasn't stranded at all, they were waiting for someone, or something, and from the look in their eyes, they weren't planning on letting me pass without a fight. I slowed down, my foot hovering over the brake pedal as I tried to think of what to do next. Should I keep driving and hope they didn't chase after me? Or should I stop and try to reason with them, even though every instinct in my body was screaming at me to get as far away from them as possible? In the end, I decided to keep driving, my eyes fixed on the road ahead as I prayed that they wouldn't come after me. But as I passed them, I saw them raise the weapon in their hand, their eyes burning with a manic intensity that sent a shiver down my spine. I sped up, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to put as much distance between us as possible. But no matter how fast I drove, I couldn't shake the feeling that they were right behind me, their gaze burning into the back of my skull like a brand. I glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see them chasing after me in hot pursuit. But to my relief, they were still standing by the side of the road, their figure growing smaller and smaller in the distance as I drove away. I breathed a sigh of relief as I realized that I was safe, at least for now. But as I continued on my way, the memory of their crazed expression and the glint of their weapon haunted me, filling me with a sense of unease that I couldn't shake. I tried to put the encounter out of my mind, telling myself that it was just a random encounter with a deranged individual. But deep down, I knew that there was something more to it, something dark and sinister that I couldn't quite put my finger on. I arrived home shaken but unharmed, the memory of the encounter still fresh in my mind. I locked all the doors and windows, my hands shaking as I tried to calm my racing heart. I called the police and reported what had happened but without any concrete evidence or description of the assailant, there was little they could do. They promised to keep an eye out for any suspicious activity, but I knew deep down that I was on my own. I spent the rest of the night huddled in my bed, my mind racing with thoughts of what could have happened if I hadn't managed to escape. I set out on my hike, eager to explore the beauty of the wilderness. The air was crisp, the sun shining down through the trees, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. It was the perfect day for an adventure. As I wandered deeper into the woods, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I brushed it off as nerves, chalking it up to the solitude of the forest. But as the day wore on, the feeling only intensified. I tried to push the thought from my mind, focusing instead on the beauty of my surroundings. But every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, sent a shiver down my spine. As the sun began its descent, I realized I had lost track of time. Nightfall was fast approaching, and I was nowhere near civilization. Panic started to set in as I realized I might have to spend the night in the woods alone. I quickened my pace hoping to make it back to the trailhead before dark. But as I rounded a bend in the path, my heart stopped. A pack of wolves stood before me, their eyes gleaming in the fading light. I froze, my mind racing as I tried to remember what to do in this situation. I knew I had to stay calm, but fear gripped me like a vice. The wolves watched me with predatory eyes, sizing me up as if deciding whether I was worth the trouble. I knew I had to do something, but my legs felt like lead. With a burst of adrenaline, I turned and ran, the sound of my footsteps echoing through the silent forest. But the wolves were faster, their powerful legs propelling them forward with terrifying speed. I pushed myself harder, my lungs burning with exertion as I fought to put distance between us. But no matter how fast I ran, the wolves were always right behind me. 
I could hear their growls growing louder, feel their hot breath on my neck as they closed in. I knew I couldn't keep this up much longer. Desperate, I searched for a way out, scanning the forest for any sign of salvation. And then, I saw it, a small cave hidden among the trees. With renewed determination, I sprinted towards the cave, the wolves hot on my heels. I dove inside just as they reached me, their snarls echoing in the darkness. I huddled in the back of the cave, my heart pounding in my chest as I listened to the wolves prowling outside. I knew I couldn't stay here forever, but I was too terrified to move. As the night wore on, the sounds of the forest grew quieter, the wolves retreating into the shadows. But I knew they were still out there, waiting for me to make a move. With trembling hands, I reached for my backpack, searching desperately for anything that could help me. And then, I found it, a small canister of pepper spray. Armed with my meager weapon, I waited for dawn to break, praying for a chance to escape. And when the first light of morning pierced the darkness, I knew it was now or never. Summoning all my courage, I burst out of the cave, spraying the wolves with pepper spray as I ran. They howled in pain and confusion, giving me the precious seconds I needed to put distance between us. I sprinted through the forest, my heart pounding in my ears as I raced towards safety. And when I finally emerged from the trees, battered and bruised but alive, I knew I had beaten the odds. As I stumbled back to civilization, I vowed never to underestimate the dangers of the wilderness again. And though the memory of that terrifying encounter would haunt me for the rest of my days, I was in the middle of my night shift at the garage, working away on some routine maintenance tasks, when I heard it, the faint sound of scratching coming from the back room where we kept the abandoned cars. At first, I tried to brush it off as just the building settling or maybe a stray animal outside, but the scratching grew louder and more persistent with each passing minute. I couldn't ignore it any longer. With a sense of unease creeping over me, I decided to go investigate. As I made my way to the back room, the scratching grew louder, echoing off the walls of the garage and sending shivers down my spine. When I reached the door to the back room, I hesitated for a moment, my hand hovering over the handle. I didn't know what I would find on the other side, but I knew I had to find out. With a deep breath, I pushed open the door and stepped inside. The room was dark and musty, the air heavy with the smell of oil and gasoline. The scratching was deafening now, filling the room with an eerie sense of foreboding. I flicked on the light switch, and what I saw made my blood run cold. The abandoned cars were covered in scratches and dents, as if something or someone had been trying to claw its way out. I approached one of the cars cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest as I ran my hand along the scratches. They were deep and jagged, as if whatever had made them was desperate to escape. I tried to shake off the feeling of unease that had settled over me, to convince myself that there must be a logical explanation for what I was seeing. But deep down, I knew that something was very wrong. I continued to explore the back room, searching for any clues that might explain the strange phenomenon. That's when I noticed it, a small, dark stain on the floor, barely visible in the dim light. I knelt down to get a closer look my heart sinking as I realized what it was. It was blood, a small pool of it, dried and caked onto the concrete floor. My mind raced with fear and uncertainty. Who or what had been in this room? And why had they left in such a hurry? I knew I had to get out of there, to find help before it was too late. With a sense of urgency, I hurried back to the main garage, my footsteps echoing loudly in the empty building. But as I reached the door, I heard it, the sound of footsteps coming from behind me. I froze in place, my heart pounding in my chest as I turned to face whatever or whoever was approaching. And that's when I saw him, a figure standing in the shadows, his eyes glinting in the dim light. I didn't recognize him, but there was something about him that sent a chill down my spine. I backed away slowly, my mind racing as I tried to think of a way out. 
But before I could make a move, the figure lunged towards me, his hands reaching out as if to grab me. I stumbled backwards, my heart racing as I tried to dodge out of the way. But he was too fast, too strong, and before I knew it, he had me pinned against the wall, his hands tightening around my throat. I struggled to break free, to scream for help, but his grip was like iron, squeezing the air out of my lungs. I could feel myself growing weaker by the second, my vision beginning to blur as darkness closed in around me. And then, just when I thought it was all over, I heard the sound of sirens in the distance. Help had arrived, just in the nick of time. With a final burst of strength, I managed to break free from the figure's grasp, collapsing to the ground as the police burst into the garage, their guns drawn and ready. The figure tried to flee, but the police were too quick for him. They apprehended him before he could get away, leading him away in handcuffs as I watched from the floor, gasping for breath and trying to make sense of what had just happened. As the adrenaline began to fade, I realized that I had narrowly escaped a brush with death. The scratching, the blood, the mysterious figure, they were all pieces of a puzzle that I would never fully understand. But one thing was clear, I would never forget the terror of that night, the feeling of being hunted by something dark and malevolent. And as I lay there on the ground, surrounded by police and flashing lights, I knew that I would never be the same again. I moved to this small town to start fresh, to leave behind the chaos and stress of the city and find some peace and quiet in the countryside. But from the moment I arrived, there was something off about the place, something that made my skin crawl and my hair stand on end. It started with my neighbor, Mr. Johnson. He seemed like a nice enough guy at first, always smiling and waving whenever we crossed paths. But the longer I lived next door to him, the more I began to suspect that there was something not quite right about him. There were the strange noises that came from his house at odd hours of the night, like muffled screams and the sound of heavy objects being dragged across the floor. And then there were the strange smells that seemed to waft from his property, like something rotting and decayed. I tried to brush off my suspicions, to convince myself that I was just being paranoid. But the more time I spent around Mr. Johnson, the more convinced I became that there was something truly sinister lurking beneath his friendly facade. One day, while I was out walking my dog, I noticed something strange in Mr. Johnson's backyard. There was a large hole dug into the ground, surrounded by piles of dirt and what looked like blood stains. I tried to convince myself that I was just imagining things, that there must be a reasonable explanation for what I was seeing. But deep down, I knew that something was very wrong, and that I needed to find out what was going on before it was too late. I made up my mind to confront Mr. Johnson about what I had seen, to demand answers and put an end to whatever dark secrets he was hiding. But when I knocked on his door and he answered, all of my resolve vanished in an instant. There was something about the look in his eyes, something cold and calculating that sent a chill down my spine. I tried to stammer out an explanation for why I was there, but he just smiled and invited me in, his voice smooth and reassuring. I stepped inside reluctantly, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to come up with a plan to get out of there alive. But before I could say anything else, Mr. Johnson offered me a drink, and I found myself accepting without thinking. As I took a sip of the liquid he handed me, I felt a sudden wave of dizziness wash over me and everything went black. When I woke up, I was lying on the floor of Mr. Johnson's basement, my hands and feet bound tightly with rope. I struggled to free myself, panic rising in my chest as I realized that I was completely at his mercy. I could hear him moving around above me, the sound of his footsteps echoing through the darkness like a death knell. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard the sound of a door creaking open followed by the unmistakable sound of someone else entering the room. I held my breath, my heart pounding in my chest as I waited for whatever horror awaited me. But instead of the expected blow, I heard a voice whispering in my ear, a voice that sent a chill down my spine. Run, it said, 
a word barely audible over the sound of my own heartbeat. Get out of here while you still can. I didn't need to be told twice. With a burst of adrenaline, I broke free of my restraints and scrambled to my feet, ignoring the pain in my limbs as I bolted for the stairs. I could hear Mr. Johnson shouting behind me, his voice filled with rage and frustration as he realized that I was escaping. But I didn't stop to look back, didn't dare to slow down until I was safely outside, the cool night air washing over me like a bomb. I stumbled out into the street, my breath coming in like a gasps as I tried to put as much distance between myself and Mr. Johnson's house as possible. And as I ran, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped something truly horrific, something that would haunt me for the rest of my days. But I didn't care. All that mattered was that I was alive, that I had survived whatever nightmare Mr. Johnson had planned for me. We were on our way back from a road trip, cruising down the highway, laughing and joking as we reminisced about the adventures we'd had. But then, disaster struck. Somehow, we missed our exit, and before we knew it, we found ourselves in the heart of a rundown neighborhood. At first, we weren't too worried. We figured we could just turn around and find our way back to the highway. But as we drove deeper into the neighborhood, we realized that things weren't as simple as they seemed. The streets were empty, the buildings dilapidated and covered in graffiti. It was like something out of a horror movie. We tried to keep calm, reassuring each other that we'd find our way out soon. But as we turned down yet another deserted street, we saw them, a group of locals, standing on the corner, watching us with cold, hostile eyes. Instinctively, we knew that something wasn't right. These weren't just ordinary people going about their business. There was something menacing about them, something that sent a shiver down our spines. As we drove past, they began to follow us, their footsteps echoing ominously on the quiet streets. Panic began to rise in my chest as I realized that we were in trouble, big trouble. We tried to lose them, taking random turns in the hopes of shaking them off our tail. But no matter what we did, they were always there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for us to slip up. And then, just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, our car suddenly sputtered and died, leaving us stranded in the middle of the street. We were sitting ducks, completely at the mercy of our pursuers. As the locals closed in on us, their faces twisted with malice, we knew that we had to act fast if we wanted to get out of this alive. With trembling hands, we locked the doors and huddled together, praying for a miracle. But it was no use. They were upon us in an instant, banging on the windows and shouting threats. We were trapped, with nowhere to run and no one to help us. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, a flicker of movement caught my eye, a narrow alleyway, hidden behind a row of dumpsters. It was our only chance. With a desperate cry, I urged my friends to follow me as I sprinted towards the alley, our pursuers hot on our heels. We ducked into the narrow passage just in time, the sound of their angry shouts fading into the distance. For what felt like hours, we stumbled through the maze of alleys and back streets, never daring to look back for fear of what we might see. But finally, just when we thought we couldn't go on any longer, we stumbled out onto a main road, our hearts pounding with relief. We flagged down a passing car and begged the driver to take us to safety, explaining our harrowing ordeal in breathless, disjointed sentences. And though they looked at us with skepticism, they must have seen the fear in our eyes, because they agreed to help us without hesitation. As we drove away from that nightmare neighborhood, leaving behind the horrors that had threatened to consume us, I couldn't help but feel a profound sense of gratitude, gratitude for our narrow escape, and for the chance to live another day. But even as we left that place behind, I knew that the memory of what had happened would stay with us forever, a constant reminder of the dangers that lurk in the shadows, waiting to pounce when we least expect it.
I am a police officer in a small town apartment complex. After a late shift, I return home, exhausted and ready to unwind. The night is quiet as I enter my apartment, the only sound the soft hum of the air conditioning. As I settle in for the night, I hear something strange, the sound of someone trying to pick the lock on my front door. My heart skips a beat as I freeze in place, listening intently to the rhythmic clicks and scrapes coming from the other side. Instinct kicks in, and I reach for my gun, my hand shaking slightly as I prepare for the worst. I'm trained for situations like this, but nothing can fully prepare you for the fear that grips you when danger lurks just outside your door. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I creep toward the door, careful to make as little noise as possible. Every creak of the floorboards feels like an eternity as I inch closer to the source of the sound. Finally, I reach the door, my heart pounding in my chest as I steel myself for what lies on the other side. With a deep breath, I throw open the door, my gun raised and ready to fire. But to my surprise, there's no one there. The hallway is empty, the only evidence of the intruder's presence the faint scrape marks on the lock. Confused and more than a little shaken, I step into the hallway, my eyes scanning the area for any sign of movement. But there's nothing, just the eerie silence of the night. I check the lock, confirming that it's secure before retreating back into my apartment, my mind racing with questions. Who would try to break into my home, and why? As I ponder the possibilities, a sense of unease settles over me like a heavy blanket. The thought of someone lurking just outside my door fills me with a creeping dread, and I find it hard to shake the feeling that I'm being watched. But despite my fear, I know that I can't let it consume me. I'm a police officer, trained to handle situations like this with calm and composure. With a deep breath, I force myself to relax, telling myself that it was just a random act of vandalism or perhaps a mistake. But deep down, I know that it was something more, something sinister lurking just beyond the edge of my vision. For the rest of the night, I keep a close eye on my surroundings, my senses heightened as I wait for any sign of trouble. But the night passes without incident, and soon, the first light of dawn begins to filter through the windows, banishing the darkness that had plagued me all night. My wife and I decided to escape the hustle and bustle of city life by retreating to a remote cabin nestled deep in the woods. It seemed like the perfect opportunity to reconnect and unwind, away from the stresses of work and everyday life. As we arrived at the cabin, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement mingled with apprehension. The surrounding forest was dense and foreboding, casting long shadows that seemed to swallow up the sunlight. Despite my unease, we unpacked our belongings and settled into the cozy interior of the cabin. The air was thick with the scent of pine, and the only sound was the occasional rustle of leaves outside. But as the sun began to set, strange things started happening. Objects seemed to move on their own, disappearing and reappearing in different places. Doors creaked open in the middle of the night, and we heard strange noises echoing through the woods. At first, we tried to brush off the occurrences as figments of our imagination. But as they grew more frequent and unsettling, we began to fear for our safety. One night, as we lay in bed, we heard footsteps outside the cabin, slow and deliberate. My wife clung to me, her breath coming in short, panic gasps as we listened to the sound drawing closer and closer. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I realized that whatever was out there was not human. It moved with an unnatural grace, its footsteps echoing through the silent forest like the approach of a predator stalking its prey. We huddled together in the darkness, our hearts pounding in our chests as the footsteps drew nearer and nearer. And then, just as suddenly as they had appeared, they stopped. For a moment, there was nothing but silence, broken only by the sound of our ragged breathing. And then, Without warning, the cabin was filled with a deafening roar, like the sound of a thousand voices screaming in unison. We bolted from the bed, scrambling to the door as the roar grew louder and louder, 
threatening to engulf us in its fury. With shaking hands, I flung open the door and we stumbled out into the night, our hearts racing with fear and adrenaline. As we ran through the woods, I could feel something watching us from the shadows, its presence looming over us like a dark cloud. But we didn't stop until we reached the safety of the nearest town, where we collapsed in exhaustion and relief. It took us weeks to recover from the trauma of that night, and even now, the memory of those strange occurrences haunts me. I don't know what we encountered out there in the woods, but I know one thing for sure, I never want to go back. I've worked the night shift as a nurse at a local hospital, which means I've seen my fair share of strange things. But nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered one fateful night. It was around 2 a.m. when I first heard the whispers, soft, almost imperceptible, but undeniably present. At first, I brushed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me. After all, hospitals can be eerie places at night, with all the creaks and groans of the building settling in the silence. But the whispers persisted, growing louder and more insistent with each passing moment. Curiosity getting the better of me, I decided to investigate, telling myself it was probably just a patient in distress or perhaps a colleague talking softly on the phone. As I approached the source of the whispers, I felt a shiver run down my spine. The room was supposed to be empty. I had checked the patient roster earlier, and there were no occupants listed for that particular room. I cautiously pushed the door open, the hinges creaking softly in protest. What I saw inside made my blood run cold. The room was bathed in an eerie red light, casting strange shadows on the walls. And there, in the center of the room, were symbols, symbols drawn in what looked like blood, covering every available surface. My heart pounding in my chest, I stepped closer, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. But the symbols were like nothing I had ever seen before, twisted and grotesque, like something out of a nightmare. And then, I heard it, a soft rustling sound coming from the corner of the room. I froze, my breath catching in my throat as I waited, terrified of what might emerge from the darkness. Seconds stretched into eternity as I stood there, paralyzed with fear. And then, from the shadows, a figure stepped forward, a figure clad in dark robes, its face obscured by a hood. I wanted to run, to scream for help, but something held me in place, rooted to the spot as the figure approached. It spoke then, its voice barely more than a whisper, but filled with a cold, malevolent energy that sent shivers down my spine. Do not be afraid, it said, its words sending a chill through the air. We mean you no harm. But I didn't believe it, couldn't believe it. There was something about the figure, something about the way it moved, that filled me with a deep sense of dread. I backed away slowly, my eyes never leaving the figure's hooded face. And then, without warning, it lunged forward, its hand reaching out to grab me. I stumbled backward my heart pounding in my chest as I turned and fled, desperate to escape the nightmare unfolding before me. As I ran, I could hear the figure's laughter echoing in my ears, taunting me with promises of darkness and despair. I didn't stop running until I reached the safety of the hospital's main lobby, where I collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath. It took me a moment to compose myself, to gather the courage to tell someone what had happened. But when I finally did, no one believed me. They said it was just a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination brought on by the stress of working the night shift. But I know what I saw, I know the truth. And though I may never be able to explain it, I will never forget the terror of that night, or the chilling whispers that still haunt my dreams. I went camping alone in a remote forest, seeking some time away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The first few days were peaceful, just me and the sounds of nature surrounding me as I hiked through the trees and set up my campsite. But then, one morning, 
I woke up to find my campsite abandoned and my belongings scattered across the forest floor. At first, I thought maybe I had just forgotten to pack up properly before heading out for the day, but as I looked around, I realized that something wasn't right. I felt a sense of unease creeping over me as I searched for clues, trying to figure out what had happened to my campsite. And then, I saw them, footprints leading away from the clearing, deeper into the forest. My heart started pounding in my chest as I realized that I was not alone out here, that someone, or something, had been in my campsite while I slept. I tried to stay calm, to think logically about what to do next, but fear gnawed at the edges of my mind, threatening to overwhelm me. I knew I had to find out who, or what, had been in my campsite, to confront whatever danger lurked in the shadows of the forest. So, I followed the footprints deeper and deeper into the woods, my senses on high alert for any sign of danger. As I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that unseen eyes were following my every move from the darkness of the trees. And then, just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, I heard the sound of branches snapping behind me, followed by the unmistakable sound of footsteps approaching. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I turned to face whatever was coming towards me. And then, emerging from the trees, I saw him, a man, tall and menacing, with a wild look in his eyes that sent shivers down my spine. I tried to run, to escape, but he was faster, stronger than I could have ever imagined. He grabbed hold of me, dragging me deeper into the forest with a strength that was inhuman. I struggled against his grip, fighting for my life as he dragged me towards a secluded clearing hidden deep in the woods. And then, just when I thought all hope was lost, I saw a glimmer of something in the distance, the faint glow of a campfire, flickering in the darkness. I knew then that I had to escape, to break free from my captor before it was too late. So, I mustered up every ounce of strength I had left and fought back with everything I had, lashing out at him with all my might. And miraculously, it worked, he stumbled backwards, giving me just enough time to break free and run towards the safety of the campfire. As I stumbled into the clearing, gasping for breath, I realized that I was not alone, there were other campers there, people who had been drawn to the warmth and light of the fire just as I had. I collapsed to the ground, exhausted and shaking, but relieved to be alive, to have escaped the clutches of my would-be attacker. And as I sat there, Surrounded by the comforting glow of the campfire and the reassuring presence of my fellow campers, I knew that I would never forget the terror of that night in the woods, or the strength and resilience that had helped me survive. I was with my friends, just hanging out on a Friday night with nothing to do. We heard rumors about this old abandoned carnival on the outskirts of town, and we decided to check it out for ourselves. As we approached, I could feel this eerie sense of anticipation building in the pit of my stomach. The carnival was like something out of a horror movie, rusted rides, broken down booths, and an overall sense of decay hanging in the air. But we were teenagers, and we were invincible, or so we thought. So, we pressed on laughing and joking as we explored the deserted grounds. But then, out of nowhere, we heard this strange noise, like whispering voices, just barely audible over the sound of the wind. We all froze, exchanging nervous glances as we tried to figure out where the sound was coming from. And that's when we saw them, a group of boys, standing in the shadows at the edge of the carnival grounds. They were watching us, their eyes gleaming with malice as they whispered among themselves. I felt this chill run down my spine as I realized that we weren't alone after all. These boys were here, lurking in the darkness, and I had no idea what they wanted from us. But before we could do anything, they started to approach us, moving slowly and deliberately like predators closing in on their prey. I tried to stay calm, to tell myself that they were just kids like us, that they didn't mean us any harm. But something about the way they looked at us, like we were nothing more than playthings for their amusement, sent a shiver down my spine. I glanced at my friends, and I could see the fear reflected in their eyes too. We all knew that we were in trouble, 
that we had to get out of there before things took a turn for the worse. But before we could make a move, one of the boys stepped forward, blocking our path. He was tall and menacing, with a cruel smirk on his lips as he stared us down. Where do you think you're going? He asked, his voice dripping with malice. I tried to speak, to explain that we were just exploring, that we didn't mean any harm. But my words caught in my throat, and all I could do was stare at him in silence. The boy laughed, a cold, hollow sound that echoed through the empty carnival grounds. You shouldn't have come here, he said, his voice low and dangerous. This is our territory, and you're trespassing. I felt a knot form in my stomach as I realized that we were in way over our heads. These boys weren't just playing around, they were serious, and they weren't going to let us leave without a fight. But before things could escalate any further, we heard the sound of approaching footsteps, loud and urgent, like someone was running towards us. And then, out of nowhere, a group of adults appeared, their faces grim as they marched towards us. I felt a surge of relief flood through me as I realized that help was finally here. We were saved. The boys, however, didn't seem as pleased. They exchanged nervous glances among themselves before backing away slowly, disappearing into the darkness without a trace. The adults helped us out of the carnival grounds, asking us what we were doing there and if we were okay. We explained everything to them telling them about the boys and how they had confronted us. The adults listened gravely, nodding their heads as they led us away from the abandoned carnival and back to safety. It was a typical night as I drove home from work, the streets quiet and deserted. But as I glanced in my rearview mirror, I noticed a car following closely behind me, its headlights piercing the darkness. At first, I didn't think much of it, assuming it was just another driver headed in the same direction. But as I turned onto side streets and took detours in an attempt to lose the car, I realized that it wasn't just coincidence, the car was following me, deliberately matching my every move. Panic began to rise in my chest as I tried to make sense of the situation, my mind racing with possibilities. I considered calling the police, but something held me back, a nagging fear that doing so would only escalate the situation further. And so, I continued to drive, my heart pounding in my chest as I searched for a way out of this terrifying predicament. But no matter where I turned, the car was always there, its presence like a dark shadow looming over me. It was as if the driver was playing a twisted game of cat and mouse, toying with me for their own amusement. As the minutes stretched into hours, I grew more and more desperate, my thoughts consumed by the need to escape from this relentless pursuit. But no matter how fast I drove or how many turns I made, the car was always right behind me, its headlights glaring in my rearview mirror like accusing eyes. I tried to remain calm, to think rationally about what to do next, but fear clouded my judgment, leaving me paralyzed with indecision. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, the car pulled alongside me, the driver's face hidden in the darkness. For a moment, we locked eyes, a silent understanding passing between us, a recognition of the danger we both faced. And then, without warning, the driver swerved in front of me, forcing me to slam on the brakes to avoid a collision. I watched in horror as the car disappeared into the night, leaving me shaken and alone on the deserted road. My heart raced as I tried to make sense of what had just happened, the adrenaline coursing through my veins as I struggled to regain control of my emotions. But even as I tried to convince myself that it was over, that I was safe at last, a nagging feeling of unease lingered in the back of my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that the driver was still out there watching and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And so, with a sense of dread weighing heavy on my heart, I continued on my journey home, the memory of that terrifying encounter etched into my mind forever. But as I pulled into my driveway and stepped out of the car, a wave of relief washed over me, relief that I had survived the nightmarish ordeal, that I had outwitted my would-be attacker and escaped with my life.
As I locked the door behind me and stepped into the safety of my home, I realized I was now safe. It was just another quiet evening in our rural farmhouse. My wife and I were enjoying a peaceful night at home, savoring the tranquility of the countryside. But then, out of nowhere, we heard it, a faint but unmistakable sound coming from the depths of the house. At first, we tried to ignore it, chalking it up to the creaks and groans that old houses tend to make. But as the minutes passed, the noise grew louder and more persistent. It sounded like someone was moving around down there, shuffling and scraping against the floorboards. With a sense of unease gnawing at us, we exchanged a worried glance before mustering up the courage to investigate. Slowly, cautiously, we made our way to the basement door, our hearts pounding in our chests. To our horror, we found the door wide open, gaping like a hungry mouth into the darkness below. We were certain we had locked it earlier, so the sight sent a shiver down our spines. With trembling hands, I reached for the light switch and flicked it on, illuminating the stairway leading down into the basement. The light revealed nothing but empty space, but the feeling of dread lingered in the air like a thick fog. Summoning all our courage, we descended the stairs, each creak of the wooden steps echoing loudly in the silence. As we reached the bottom, we scanned the dimly lit room, searching for any sign of intruders. But aside from the usual clutter, old furniture, stacks of boxes, and cobwebs clinging to the walls, there was nothing out of the ordinary. No signs of forced entry, no indication that anyone had been down here. Confused and on edge, we exchanged nervous glances, unsure of what to do next. Should we call the police? Or was it just our imaginations playing tricks on us? As we stood there, grappling with our fear and uncertainty, the noise suddenly started up again, louder this time, more insistent. It sounded like footsteps, heavy and deliberate, echoing through the darkness. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realized that we were not alone in the basement. Someone, or something, was down here with us, lurking in the shadows. Heart pounding, I called out, my voice trembling with fear. Who's there? But there was no response, only the sound of footsteps drawing closer, closer. In a panic, we scrambled back up the stairs, desperate to escape whatever lurked below. I slammed the basement door shut behind us, locking it securely this time, but the sense of dread lingered like a dark cloud over our heads. We debated whether to call the police, but without any evidence of a break-in, we knew they wouldn't take us seriously. And besides, what could they do? We were on our own out here in the middle of nowhere. For the rest of the night, we huddled together in our bedroom, too terrified to sleep, listening intently for any more signs of intruders. But aside from the occasional creak of the floorboards and the howling of the wind outside, the house remained silent. Morning finally dawned, casting a pale light into the room and dispelling some of the darkness that had gripped us during the night. With a sense of relief, we ventured downstairs, half expecting to find the basement door wide open again. But to our surprise, everything seemed normal. The door was still locked, and there were no signs of anyone, or anything, having been down there. As the day wore on, we tried to put the events of the previous night behind us, chalking it up to our imaginations running wild. But deep down, we couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. To this day, we still don't know what happened that night, whether it was a prowler, an animal, or something more sinister. I've always been fascinated by plants, their intricate designs and unique properties never cease to amaze me. So when I got the chance to venture into the woods to study plant life for my research project, I jumped at the opportunity. Armed with my notebook, camera, 
and trusty field guide, I set out into the wilderness, eager to uncover the secrets hidden within the forest. The sun was shining, birds were chirping, and everything seemed to be going according to plan. But then I stumbled upon it, a strange, otherworldly plant unlike anything I had ever seen before. Its leaves were a vibrant shade of purple, its petals shimmering in the sunlight like something out of a fairy tale. I knew I had to study it further, to uncover its secrets and unlock the mysteries of this strange and beautiful specimen. As I knelt down to get a closer look, I felt a sense of unease wash over me, a nagging feeling that something wasn't quite right. But I brushed it off as nerves, chalking it up to the excitement of discovering something new and unknown. But as I continued to study the plant, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something was lurking in the shadows, just out of sight. I tried to ignore it, to focus on my work, but the feeling only grew stronger with each passing moment. And then, just as I was about to take a sample of the plant for further analysis, I heard it the sound of footsteps crunching through the underbrush, coming closer and closer with each passing second. I froze in terror, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to listen for any sign of danger. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him, a man emerging from the trees, his face obscured by the shadows, his movements slow and deliberate. I didn't know who he was or what he wanted, but I knew I had to get out of there, to escape before it was too late. I scrambled to my feet, my hands shaking as I fumbled with my backpack, searching desperately for my phone. But when I finally found it, I realized with horror that I had no signal, no way of calling for help. Panic set in as I realized I was completely alone, stranded in the woods with no way of contacting the outside world. I knew I had to get out of there, to escape before the stranger caught up to me and whatever danger lurked within the forest. I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest as I sprinted through the underbrush, the sound of footsteps echoing in my ears as the stranger gave chase. I didn't know how long I could keep running, how much longer I could evade capture, but I knew I had to try. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, I stumbled upon a clearing in the forest, a small patch of sunlight breaking through the trees. I knew I had to make a stand, to confront my pursuer and fight for my life. I turned to face him, my hands trembling as I braced myself for the inevitable confrontation. But when he emerged from the shadows, his face contorted with rage, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. He lunged at me, his hands reaching out to grab hold of me, but I fought back with everything I had lashing out with all my strength as I struggled to break free from his grasp. And then, just when it seemed like all was lost, I heard the sound of approaching footsteps, the unmistakable sound of rescue. I turned to see a group of hikers emerging from the trees, their faces filled with concern as they rushed to my aid. Together, we managed to overpower my attacker, to subdue him long enough for the authorities to arrive and take him into custody. As I sat there, Shaking and battered but alive, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the strangers who had come to my rescue, for the kindness of those who had risked their own safety to help a stranger in need. I used to think my small town was like any other quiet, unassuming place. That was until I stumbled upon something that turned my world upside down. It all started innocently enough. As a scientist, I was always curious, always looking for new discoveries. But what I found lurking beneath the surface of my town was beyond anything I could have imagined. One day, while going about my usual routine, I noticed some strange occurrences, mysterious fans coming and going at odd hours, shadowy figures lurking in the alleyways. At first, I brushed it off as nothing more than my imagination playing tricks on me. But the more I dug, the more I realized that something sinister was at play. I followed my instincts and decided to investigate further. Sneaking into abandoned buildings, listening in on hushed conversations, I did whatever it took to uncover the truth. And what I found was chilling. Hidden laboratories, filled with equipment and technology far beyond anything I had ever seen before. 
but it wasn't just the equipment that sent shivers down my spine. It was what they were using it for, conducting experiments on innocent people, unleashing horrors that should have never seen the light of day. I knew I had to do something, to expose the truth and put an end to the madness. But as I started gathering evidence, I realized that I was being watched, that those responsible for the experiments knew I was onto them. I became paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder, jumping at every sound. But no matter how careful I was, they always seemed to be one step ahead of me. And then, one night, they made their move. I was working late in my lab when I heard the sound of footsteps approaching from behind. I turned around just in time to see a group of masked men burst through the door, guns drawn. They grabbed me roughly, dragging me out into the night. I tried to fight back, to break free from their grip, but they were too strong. They threw me into the back of a fan, and before I knew it, we were speeding away into the darkness. I had no idea where they were taking me, what they had planned for me. All I knew was that I was in deep trouble and I needed to find a way out, and fast. As the hours passed, I racked my brain for any possible escape plan. But the van was like a fortress, with no way out in sight. But just when I was about to lose hope, I heard the sound of sirens approaching in the distance. The police had found us, alerted by a tip from a concerned citizen who had seen me being abducted. The van screeched to a halt, and the masked men fled into the night, leaving me behind in their wake. The police rushed to my aid, helping me out of the van and checking me over for injuries. I was shaken but alive, grateful to be out of the clutches of those responsible for the horrors being unleashed in my town. In the days that followed, the truth about the experiments came to light, and those responsible were brought to justice. I was working my usual night shift as a security officer at the university, patrolling the campus to ensure everything was safe and secure. It was a quiet night, with only the occasional sound of my footsteps echoing through the empty corridors. As I made my rounds, I heard a faint sound coming from the direction of the library. It was a low, rhythmic chanting that sent shivers down my spine. I hesitated for a moment trying to brush it off as my imagination playing tricks on me. But the chanting grew louder as I approached the library, echoing off the walls and filling the air with an eerie energy. I knew I couldn't ignore it any longer, so I made my way inside, my heart pounding in my chest. The library was dark and deserted, the only light coming from the dim overhead fixtures. I followed the sound of the chanting down to the basement, where it grew louder with each step I took. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I froze in horror at what I saw. A group of students stood in a circle, their faces twisted in concentration as they chanted in unison. In the center of the circle was a makeshift altar, adorned with candles and strange symbols. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, it was like something out of a nightmare. But there was no time to waste. I had to stop them before it was too late. I stepped forward, my voice shaking as I called out to them, demanding to know what they were doing. But they ignored me, their chanting growing louder and more frantic with each passing moment. I reached for my radio, intending to call for backup, but before I could do anything, one of the students turned towards me, their eyes blazing with an otherworldly intensity. And then, without warning, they lunged at me, their hands reaching out with a terrifying intent. I stumbled backward, barely managing to dodge out of the way in time. The other students joined in, their movements fluid and coordinated as they closed in on me from all sides. I was outnumbered and outmatched, my only option to fight for my life. I ducked and weaved, dodging their blows as best as I could. But they were relentless, their attacks coming at me from every direction. I managed to land a few hits of my own, but it wasn't enough to stop them. They were like a force of nature, unstoppable and unyielding in their pursuit of whatever dark purpose they were serving. Just when I thought I couldn't hold out any longer, I saw a glimmer of hope, 
the sound of approaching footsteps echoing down the stairs. Backup had arrived, and just in time. With renewed determination, I fought back with everything I had, using every ounce of strength and skill to fend off my attackers. Together, we managed to overpower them, restraining them and securing the scene until the authorities could arrive to take them into custody. As I caught my breath, I couldn't help but wonder what had driven those students to perform such a dark and sinister ritual. What were they trying to achieve, and what would have happened if we hadn't stopped them in time? It was a chilling reminder that evil could lurk in even the most unexpected of places, and that it was up to people like me to stand up and fight against it, no matter the cost. I've always been drawn to the thrill of uncovering hidden truths, so when I heard about the string of disappearances plaguing a small town not far from where I live, I knew I had to investigate. Armed with my notebook and camera, I set out to uncover the truth behind the unsettling phenomenon. As I arrived in the town, I was struck by the eerie stillness that seemed to hang over the streets like a shroud. The locals eyed me with suspicion as I asked questions about the missing people, their answers guarded and vague. Undeterred, I pressed on, determined to unravel the mystery that had gripped the town in fear. I spent hours combing through old newspaper archives and interviewing residents, piecing together a timeline of the disappearances and searching for any clues that might lead me to the truth. But the more I dug, the more I realized that there was something sinister lurking beneath the surface of this seemingly ordinary town. People whispered about secret meetings held in the dead of night, and strange symbols painted on the walls of abandoned buildings. I followed every lead, no matter how obscure, desperate to uncover the truth. And then, just when I thought I had hit a dead end, I stumbled upon a hidden basement beneath an old bookstore, a basement filled with evidence that would change everything. As I sifted through the stacks of papers and photographs, my heart pounded in my chest with a mixture of fear and excitement. I had stumbled upon a conspiracy so vast and far-reaching that it sent shivers down my spine. The disappearances were not random, they were orchestrated, part of a larger scheme to cover up the truth about the town's dark past. And as I delved deeper into the mystery, I realized that I was now alone in my investigation. Someone was watching me, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I could feel their eyes on me wherever I went their presence a constant threat that loomed over me like a dark cloud. But I refused to back down, determined to expose the truth no matter the cost. I followed the trail of breadcrumbs, piecing together the puzzle one clue at a time, until finally, I uncovered the shocking truth behind the disappearances. The town was built on a foundation of lies and deceit, its very existence a testament to the lengths people will go to protect their secrets. And as I stared into the abyss of darkness that lay before me, I knew that I had to act fast if I wanted to escape with my life. With my heart pounding in my chest, I raced through the streets, desperate to stay one step ahead of my pursuers. But no matter how fast I ran, they were always one step behind, their shadowy figures lurking just out of sight. I knew that I was running out of time, that if I didn't act soon, I would become just another victim of the town's twisted conspiracy. But even as the fear threatened to consume me, I refused to give up hope. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, I stumbled upon a clue that would change everything. A hidden journal tucked away in the basement of an abandoned house, its pages filled with the secrets of the town's darkest secrets. Armed with this newfound knowledge, I raced to the local police station, determined to expose the truth once and for all. But as I burst through the doors, I realized that I was too late, the conspiracy ran deeper than I ever imagined, and the people I thought I could trust were in on it too. With nowhere left to turn, I knew that my only hope was to escape the town and expose the truth to the world. And as I disappeared into the night, I vowed that I would never stop fighting until justice was served, no matter the cost.
I was driving down a deserted road late at night when I saw it, a car, parked haphazardly in the middle of the road, its hazard lights flashing. At first, I thought it might have broken down, but as I got closer, I could see that something wasn't right. There was no one around, no sign of the driver anywhere. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if I should turn around and find another route, but something compelled me to stop and investigate. I pulled up behind the car and got out, my heart pounding in my chest. As I approached, I could see that the driver's side door was hanging open, swinging gently in the breeze. I peered inside, half expecting to find someone slumped over the steering wheel, but the car was empty. That's when I noticed it, a piece of paper, folded neatly on the dashboard. I reached out and unfolded it, my hands trembling as I read the words scrawled across the page. Help me, it said, the letters smeared with what looked like blood. My stomach churned as I realized why I was holding a cry for help from someone in trouble. Without thinking, I turned and ran back to my car, fumbling with the keys as I tried to start the engine. But before I could pull away, I heard it a noise coming from the darkness beyond the road, a low, guttural sound that sent a shiver down my spine. I looked up to see a figure emerging from the shadows, moving towards me with slow, deliberate steps. My blood ran cold as I realized that whoever had left that note was still out there, watching and waiting. Panic set in as I realized that I was trapped, with no way to escape. I frantically searched for my phone, but it was nowhere to be found, lost in the chaos of the moment. I glanced back at the car, hoping against hope that whoever had left the note was still alive, that I could help them somehow. But as I looked closer, I could see that the blood on the note was fresh, still wet and glistening in the moonlight. A sense of dread washed over me as I realized that I was in way over my head, that I had stumbled into something far more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. I knew I had to get out of there, to find help before it was too late. But as I turned to run, I heard the sound of footsteps behind me, growing louder and closer with each passing second. I ran as fast as I could, my heart pounding in my chest as I raced through the darkness, my mind racing with thoughts of what might happen if I didn't make it out alive. I stumbled and fell, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I struggled to get back to my feet. But before I could get far, I felt a hand grab hold of my ankle, dragging me back into the darkness. I screamed and thrashed, trying to break free, but it was no use. The grip on my ankle only tightened, pulling me further and further away from safety. I fought with every ounce of strength I had left, determined not to go down without a fight. But as I looked up into the face of my attacker, I knew that I was no match for them. I closed my eyes and braced for the worst, but instead of feeling a blow or a knife at my throat, I heard a voice, low and urgent. Run, it said, and I didn't need to be told twice. I scrambled to my feet and took off, not daring to look back until I was safely out of sight. When I finally stopped running, I collapsed on the ground, shaking and gasping for breath. I had no idea what had just happened, or how I had managed to escape with my life. I'm an experienced hunter, been doing it for years. So, when I heard rumors of a rare game species deep in the woods, I couldn't resist the temptation to track it down. Armed with my trusty rifle and a backpack full of supplies, I set out into the dense forest, eager for the thrill of the hunt. At first, everything seemed normal. The forest was alive with the sounds of birds and small animals scurrying through the underbrush. But as I ventured deeper into the woods, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I brushed off the sensation as paranoia, chalking it up to the isolation of the wilderness. But as the hours passed and the feeling persisted, I started to grow uneasy. It wasn't long before I realized that I wasn't alone out there. Something was stalking me, lurking in the shadows just beyond the edge of my vision. I couldn't see it, but I could feel its presence, like a predator sizing up its prey. 
I tried to push the fear aside and focus on the hunt, but the feeling of being hunted only grew stronger. Every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves sent a shiver down my spine, and I found myself constantly glancing over my shoulder, searching for any sign of my unseen pursuer. As night fell, the forest grew even more sinister. The shadows seemed to stretch and twist, obscuring my vision and making it impossible to see more than a few feet in front of me. I knew I needed to find shelter before it got too dark, but every step I took felt like I was walking deeper into a trap. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard it a low, guttural growl echoing through the trees. My blood ran cold as I realized that whatever was stalking me was getting closer, its hunger driving it to attack. I broke into a run, my heart pounding in my chest as I sprinted through the forest, desperate to put as much distance between myself and the unseen predator as possible. But no matter how fast I ran, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was right behind me, its hot breath on my neck. I stumbled over roots and fallen branches, my lungs burning with exertion as I fought to keep moving. I knew I couldn't keep this up forever, sooner or later, I would tire, and then I would be at the mercy of whatever was hunting me. Just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I spotted a small clearing up ahead. With a burst of adrenaline-fueled energy, I pushed myself to run faster, knowing that safety was within reach. As I reached the clearing, I saw a small cabin nestled among the trees. It was a welcome sight, a beacon of hope in the darkness of the forest. Without hesitation, I dashed towards it, throwing open the door and stumbling inside, panting and exhausted. I slammed the door shut behind me, leaning against it for support as I caught my breath. For a moment, everything was silent, the only sound the pounding of my heart in my ears. But then I heard it, a low, menacing growl coming from just outside the cabin. My blood turned to ice as I realized that whatever had been hunting me was still out there, waiting for me to let my guard down. I knew I couldn't stay in the cabin forever. Sooner or later, I would have to leave and face whatever was lurking in the darkness outside. But for now, I was safe, and that was all that mattered. I spent the night huddled in the corner of the cabin, my rifle clutched tightly in my hands as I listened to the sounds of the forest outside. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of leaves, sent a shiver down my spine, and I knew that I would never be able to relax until I was safely out of the woods. As dawn broke, I mustered up the courage to leave the safety of the cabin and make my way back to civilization. I kept my rifle close at hand, ready to defend myself if necessary, but thankfully, the forest was silent as I made my way through it. It wasn't until I reached the edge of the woods that I allowed myself to breathe a sigh of relief. I had made it out alive, but the memory of that night would haunt me forever. F. I'm a seasoned mountaineer and I faced some tough challenges in my time. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened on my solo expedition in the snowy woods. I set out on a clear morning, the crisp mountain air filling my lungs as I trudged through the fresh powder. The snow was deep, but I was confident in my skills and eager to tackle the wilderness on my own. As the day wore on, the weather took a turn for the worse. Dark clouds rolled in, blotting out the sun and plunging the forest into a gray twilight. I pushed on, determined to reach my destination before the storm hit. But as the snow began to fall in earnest, I realized that I was in for more than I bargained for. The blizzard descended quickly, the wind whipping through the trees with a ferocity that made it hard to see more than a few feet in front of me. I tried to keep my bearings, but the swirling snow disoriented me, and before long, I realized that I was hopelessly lost. Panic set in as I struggled to find my way, my heart pounding in my chest as I fought against the biting cold and the relentless wind. I stumbled through the woods, my boots sinking into the deep snow with each step, my hands numb with cold as I clutched my map and compass. But no matter which way I turned, I couldn't seem to find my way out of the forest. The trees loomed overhead like dark sentinels, their branches twisted and gnarled in the gloom. 
Hours passed, but it felt like an eternity as I battled against the elements, my energy waning with each passing moment. Just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I spotted a faint light through the trees. It was a small cabin, nestled in a clearing just ahead. Relief flooded through me as I stumbled toward the cabin, my limbs heavy with exhaustion as I pushed open the door and stumbled inside. The cabin was small and dimly lit, but it offered shelter from the storm, and that was all that mattered. I collapsed onto the floor, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I tried to warm my frozen limbs by the fire. But as I lay there, trying to regain my strength, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. There was a sense of unease in the air, a feeling of being watched that sent shivers down my spine. I tried to push the feeling aside, telling myself that it was just my imagination running wild in the midst of the storm. But deep down, I knew that something wasn't right. As the night wore on, the feeling of unease only grew stronger. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind outside, sent a jolt of fear through me, and I found myself jumping at shadows in the darkness. But despite my fear, I knew that I couldn't stay in the cabin forever. I needed to find my way back to safety, no matter what it took. With a sense of determination, I forced myself to my feet, my muscles protesting with every step as I made my way to the door. But as I reached for the handle, I froze. There was a sound outside, a soft scraping noise that sent a chill down my spine. I hesitated, my hand hovering inches from the door as I listened intently. And then, without warning, the scraping stopped, replaced by a deafening silence that seemed to echo through the cabin. For a moment, I stood there, unsure of what to do. But then, with a surge of adrenaline, I threw open the door and stepped outside, ready to face whatever lay beyond. But to my surprise, there was nothing there. The clearing was empty, the storm still raging overhead as I stood alone in the darkness. Confused and more than a little shaken, I retreated back inside the cabin, locking the door behind me as I tried to make sense of what had just happened. But despite my best efforts, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that there was something out there in the darkness, waiting for me to let my car down. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realized that I was in more danger than I had ever imagined. And as the storm raged on outside, I knew that I would have to summon every ounce of courage and determination to make it out of the woods alive. As I huddled inside the cabin, the storm raged on outside, the wind howling like a pack of wolves and the snow piling up against the windows. I knew I couldn't stay there forever, but the thought of venturing out into the darkness filled me with dread. I tried to keep myself busy, stoking the fire and rationing what little food I had left. But every creak of the floorboards made my heart skip a beat, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was lurking just beyond the walls, waiting for me to make a move. Hours passed, the darkness outside seemingly impenetrable as I waited for the storm to pass. But as the night dragged on, I realized that I couldn't stay cooped up in the cabin forever. With a deep breath, I made the decision to venture out into the cold, hoping against hope that I could find my way back to safety. Bracing myself against the biting wind, I stepped outside, the snow crunching beneath my boots as I trudged through the deep drifts. For hours, I stumbled through the forest, my hands numb with cold as I clutched my map and compass, praying for a glimpse of familiar landmarks. But as the storm raged on, it became increasingly clear that I was hopelessly lost. The trees loomed overhead like silent sentinels, their branches laden with snow as they swayed in the wind. Just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I spotted a faint light through the trees. It was a beacon of hope in the darkness, and I stumbled toward it with renewed determination. As I drew closer, I realized that it was a cabin, much like the one I had sought shelter in earlier. But this one seemed different somehow, more inviting and I felt a surge of relief flood through me as I approached the door. I knocked tentatively, my heart pounding in my chest as I waited for a response. And then, to my surprise, the door swung open, revealing a warm, welcoming glow from within. Relief flooded through me as I stepped inside, the warmth of the fire washing over me like a wave. 
The cabin was small but cozy, and I collapsed onto the floor, overcome with exhaustion as I allowed myself to relax for the first time in what felt like an eternity. As I lay there, basking in the warmth of the fire, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the stroke of luck that had led me here. I was in the kitchen, washing dishes after dinner, when I realized that my son wasn't playing in his room like he usually did at this time. I called out his name, but there was no response. I checked his room, thinking maybe he'd fallen asleep, but he wasn't there. Panic started to rise in my chest as I searched the house, calling his name over and over again. But he wasn't anywhere to be found. I ran outside, calling his name as I scanned the yard and the street, but there was no sign of him. I felt this overwhelming sense of fear wash over me as I realized that my son was missing. I didn't know what to do, where to look, or who to turn to for help. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, my hands shaking as I tried to explain the situation to the operator. They assured me that they would send someone to help but the minutes felt like hours as I waited for them to arrive. When the police got there, they took down all the details, my son's name, what he was wearing, where he was last seen, and promised to do everything they could to find him. But as the hours passed with no sign of him, I felt this overwhelming sense of despair settle over me. I couldn't help but imagine the worst case scenarios, or if he'd been kidnapped, or hurt, or worse. I couldn't bear the thought of never seeing him again, of not knowing what had happened to him. I pleaded with the police to do more, to search harder, but there was only so much they could do. So, I took matters into my own hands. I printed out flyers with my son's picture and plastered them all over town, hoping that someone would see them and have information about his whereabouts. I also reached out to friends and family asking them to spread the word and keep an eye out for any sign of my son. But days turned into weeks, and still, there was no sign of him. I felt like I was living in a nightmare, like my world had been shattered into a million pieces and I didn't know how to put it back together. I couldn't eat or sleep, couldn't focus on anything but finding my son. Every moment of every day was consumed by the desperate need to bring him home safe and sound. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I received a phone call from an unknown number. My heart leaped into my throat as I answered, praying that it was someone with information about my son. But when I heard the voice on the other end of the line, my blood ran cold. It was a man, his voice low and menacing as he told me that he had my son and that if I ever wanted to see him again, I would have to do exactly as he said. I felt this surge of terror wash over me as I realized that my worst fears had come true. My son had been kidnapped, and now I was being forced to play some twisted game in order to get him back. I tried to keep my composure as the man laid out his demands, ran some money, dropped off at a specific location at a specific time, with no police involvement or else. I knew I had no choice but to comply. My son's life was on the line and I would do anything to save him. So, I gathered up the money, praying that it would be enough to secure his release, and set out to meet the kidnapper at the designated location. I felt sick to my stomach as I drove, my hands shaking on the wheel as I imagined what might happen if things went wrong. But when I arrived at the drop-off point, the kidnapper was nowhere to be found. I waited for what felt like hours, but there was no sign of him. I felt this overwhelming sense of despair wash over me as I realized that I had been played, that my son's kidnapper had no intention of letting him go. But then, just when I was about to give up hope, I heard a noise behind me. I turned around, and there he was, my son, safe and sound, running towards me with tears streaming down his face. I felt this overwhelming surge of relief flood through me as I scooped him up into my arms holding him tight and never wanting to let him go. He told me that he had managed to escape from his captor, that he had been hiding out in the woods until he could find someone to help him. I couldn't believe it, my son was alive, and he was safe. I hugged him tighter than I ever had before, vowing to never let him out of my sight again. 
And as we drove home together, I couldn't help but feel grateful. Grateful that my son was back where he belonged, and grateful for the chance to hold him in my arms once again. It was a regular night shift at the theme park where I worked as a security officer. The park was closed, and my job was to make sure everything was in order and that there were no unauthorized visitors lurking around. As I made my rounds, I noticed something odd, strange activity in the closed-off area of the park. Lights flickering, shadows moving where they shouldn't be. I felt a chill run down my spine as I approached cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. As I got closer, I heard voices, whispers, laughter, the sound of footsteps echoing through the night. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized that there were people in the park, people who shouldn't be there. I crept closer, my senses on high alert as I tried to catch a glimpse of the intruders. And then, I saw them, a group of figures huddled together, moving furtively through the shadows. I hesitated for a moment, unsure of what to do. But then, I remembered my training, it was my duty to protect the park and its guests, no matter what. With a deep breath, I stepped forward, shining my flashlight on the trespassers and ordering them to freeze. They froze, startled by the sudden light, their faces twisted in fear and surprise. I could see now that they were just teenagers probably looking for a thrill on a late night adventure. But that didn't excuse their behavior, they were breaking the law, and I couldn't let them get away with it. I approached them cautiously, keeping my distance as I demanded to know what they were doing in the park after hours. They stammered and stuttered, trying to come up with an excuse, but I wasn't buying it. I radioed for backup, knowing that I would need help to deal with the trespassers. But as I waited for assistance to arrive, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about these kids, something sinister lurking beneath the surface. As we waited for backup to arrive, the tension in the air grew thick, the silence broken only by the sound of our breathing and the faint rustling of leaves in the wind. And then, without warning, one of the kids lunged at me, a knife glinting in his hand. I dodged out of the way just in time, adrenaline coursing through my veins as I fought to defend myself. We struggled, grappling with each other in the darkness as the other kids looked on in horror. But I refused to back down, determined to protect myself and the park from these dangerous intruders. With a burst of strength, I managed to overpower the knife-wielding teenager, pinning him to the ground as I waited for backup to arrive. Minutes felt like hours as we waited for help to arrive, the tension in the air palpable as we held our breath, waiting for the sound of approaching sirens. And then, finally, the sound we had been waiting for, the blaring of sirens as backup arrived on the scene, taking the trespassers into custody and securing the area. As I stepped back from the chaos, my heart still racing from the encounter, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief that I had survived. That I had been able to protect myself and the park from harm. It was a typical night at the dispatch office for roadside assistance. The phone had been ringing off the hook with calls from stranded motorists, but this one was different. The caller's voice was tense as they described seeing a figure standing by the side of the road, watching them. They sounded genuinely scared, which sent a shiver down my spine. I quickly assured them that help was on the way, dispatching a tow truck to their location. But as I hung up the phone, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I glanced at the clock, it was nearly midnight, and couldn't help but feel a sense of unease settle over me. As I waited for the tow truck to arrive, I couldn't shake the feeling that the caller wasn't alone out there on the dark, deserted road. Minutes felt like hours as I anxiously monitored the GPS tracker on the tow truck, willing it to reach the caller's location safely. And then, finally, the truck arrived, but there was no sign of the stranded motorist. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to reach the caller again, 
but their phone was going straight to voicemail. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I knew that something was terribly wrong. I quickly alerted the authorities, relaying all the information I had about the caller's location and the mysterious figure they had seen. As I waited for news, my mind raced with horrifying possibilities. What if the caller had been abducted? What if they were in danger? Minutes turned into hours as I waited anxiously for any word from the authorities. And then, finally, the phone rang, it was the police, and they had news. They had found the caller's car abandoned on the side of the road, but there was no sign of the caller anywhere. My heart sank as I realized that the worst case scenario had come true, the caller had disappeared without a trace. As the days passed with no sign of a missing motorist, I couldn't shake the feeling of guilt that gnawed at me. If only I had acted faster, if only I had sent help sooner, maybe things would have turned out differently. But deep down, I knew that there was something more sinister at play here, something beyond my control. Weeks turned into months, and still, there was no sign of a missing motorist. The case remained unsolved, a dark shadow hanging over the small town where it had all begun. But even as life returned to normal for everyone else, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that lingered in the back of my mind. Because deep down, I knew that whatever had happened to the missing motorist could happen to anyone, and that thought terrified me more than anything else. So, I was out hiking in the woods, trying to clear my head and get away from it all for a while. I'd been walking for hours, and the sun was starting to set, casting long shadows across the forest floor. That's when I stumbled upon the cabin. It was hidden away in a clearing, surrounded by thick trees and overgrown bushes. At first, I thought it was abandoned, but as I got closer, I could see that the door was slightly ajar. I hesitated for a moment, unsure if I should go inside. But then the wind picked up, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I knew I didn't have much of a choice, I had to seek shelter for the night. So, I pushed open the door and stepped inside. The air was stale and musty, and the floorboards creaked under my weight as I made my way further into the cabin. That's when I saw them, the human remains, scattered around the room like discarded trash. My heart skipped a beat as I realized what I was looking at, and I felt bile rise in my throat. I stumbled backwards, my mind reeling with horror as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. But there was no denying it, this cabin was the lair of a deranged killer, and I had stumbled right into their clutches. I knew I had to get out of there, to escape before the killer returned and found me in their hideout. But as I turned to leave, I heard a noise, a low, guttural crawl coming from somewhere deep within the cabin. I froze in terror, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to see through the darkness. But there was nothing there, nothing but shadows and silence. I knew I had to leave, to get as far away from this place as possible. But as I made my way to the door, I stumbled over something, a trapdoor hidden beneath a rug in the corner of the room. Curiosity got the better of me and I lifted the trapdoor to reveal a set of stairs leading down into darkness. I hesitated for a moment, unsure if I should go down there. But then I heard another noise, a faint whimpering coming from somewhere deep within the darkness. I knew I couldn't leave whoever was down there to suffer alone. So, I gathered up my courage and descended into the depths of the cabin. The air grew colder as I made my way down the stairs, and the darkness seemed to swallow me whole. But I pressed on, driven by a sense of urgency and desperation. And then, just when I thought I couldn't go any further, I stumbled upon a sight that chilled me to the bone. It was a room, small and cramped, with chains hanging from the walls and a single figure huddled in the corner. I approached cautiously my heart pounding in my chest as I realized who or what I was looking at. It was a person, barely alive and covered in bruises and cuts. I rushed to their side, my hands shaking as I tried to free them from their chains. But as I worked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that the killer was lurking just out of sight, 
waiting to strike. I didn't dare to look behind me as I worked, my hands moving as quickly as they could as I tried to free the person from their bonds. And then, finally, the chains fell away, and I helped them to their feet. We didn't waste a second. We ran, our footsteps echoing through the darkness as we raced to escape the cabin and the horrors that lurked within. And then, just when I thought we were safe, I heard it, the sound of footsteps echoing through the darkness behind us, getting closer and closer with each passing second. We didn't dare to look back. We just ran faster, our hearts pounding in our chests as we prayed for a miracle. And then, finally, we burst out of the cabin and into the blinding light of day. We didn't stop running until we were safely back at the trailhead, our bodies trembling with exhaustion and fear. We didn't speak as we made our way back to civilization, our minds reeling with the horrors we had witnessed. I was driving with my friends late at night, cruising down the highway, when suddenly, we heard this loud thud. It was like something had slammed into the front of the car. We all jolted in our seats, startled by the noise. I slammed on the brakes and we came to a screeching halt on the side of the road. What was that? One of my friends asked, their voice shaking with fear. I didn't know, but I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Something didn't feel right about it. We got out of the car and walked around to the front, shining our flashlights on the road ahead. And that's when we saw it a mangled mess of fur and blood lying in the middle of the highway. My heart sank as I realized what had happened. We hit an animal, and it looked like it was dead. But then, to our horror, the creature stirred. It let out this guttural groan and started to twitch, its limbs jerking spasmodically. We all froze, unsure of what to do. Should we try to help it? Or should we just leave it and call for help? Before we could make up our minds, the creature let out this blood-curdling scream, a sound that chilled me to the bone. And then it started to change, its body contorting and shifting in unnatural ways, like it was transforming into something else entirely. We stumbled back in horror, watching as the creature grew larger and more monstrous with each passing second. And then, without warning, it lunged at us, its claws outstretched and its eyes glowing with malice. We screamed and ran back to the car, scrambling inside and locking the doors behind us. But the creature wasn't done yet. It smashed into the car, pounding on the windows and trying to force its way inside. We were trapped, with nowhere to run and no way to defend ourselves. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as the creature continued its assault, its screams echoing in my ears. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, we heard the sound of approaching headlights. It was another car, coming down the highway towards us. I prayed that they would see us and stop to help. And thankfully, they did. The driver slammed on the brakes and skidded to a halt beside us, jumping out of the car and running over to see what was going on. They saw the creature attacking us and wasted no time in helping us fend it off. Together, we managed to drive it away chasing it back into the darkness where it came from. I don't know what that thing was, or why it attacked us, but I'm grateful to be alive. And as we drove away from that nightmare on the highway, I knew that I would never forget the terror of that night for as long as I lived. I was alone in my penthouse suite trying to unwind after a long day of work. The city lights twinkled outside my window, casting eerie shadows across the room. That's when I heard it, the sound of someone pacing back and forth in the hallway outside my door. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but as the footsteps grew louder, more distinct, I realized that someone was actually there. My heart began to race as I approached the door, my hand trembling as I reached for the handle. I hesitated for a moment, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. Should I open the door? 
Should I call the police? But before I could make a decision, there was a knock, three sharp raps that echoed through the silent hallway. With a sense of dread, I slowly opened the door, my eyes widening in shock as I came face to face with my neighbor, his eyes wild with anger, a weapon clutched tightly in his hand. I took a step back, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to make sense of what was happening. What are you doing here? I stammered, my voice barely above a whisper. He didn't answer. Instead, he just stood there, staring at me with a look of intense hatred, his grip tightening on the weapon in his hand. And then, without warning, he lunged forward, his eyes blazing with fury. I stumbled backward, my mind reeling with fear and confusion as I tried to defend myself against the sudden attack. But just as I thought all hope was lost, I heard a voice, the voice of another neighbor, calling out from down the hall. Is everything okay? They shouted, their voice filled with concern. In that moment of distraction, I managed to break free from my attacker's grasp, scrambling to my feet and fleeing down the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest as I raced towards safety. I didn't stop running until I reached the lobby, where I collapsed in a heap, gasping for breath, my mind spinning with fear and confusion. The police were called, and they arrived moments later taking my neighbor into custody and ensuring that I was safe. It turns out that he had been struggling with mental health issues for some time, and in his delusional state, he had become convinced that I was somehow responsible for his problems. It was a terrifying ordeal, one that left me shaken to my core. But in the end, I was grateful to be alive, grateful to have escaped with my life intact. And as I sat there in the safety of the lobby, Surrounded by concerned neighbors and flashing police lights, I couldn't help but feel a profound sense of relief. I live alone in a high-rise apartment, and lately, things have been getting strange. It all started a few weeks ago when I began receiving threatening emails from an anonymous sender. At first, I thought it was just spam or some kind of prank, but the messages quickly escalated from vague threats to specific details about my life. The emails were unnerving, filled with personal information that only someone close to me would know. They knew where I worked, where I lived, even details about my daily routine. It was like they were watching me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I tried to trace the emails, but every time I did, they led back to my own computer. It didn't make any sense, how could someone be sending me messages from my own email account? I changed all of my passwords, ran virus scans, even contacted the police, but there was nothing they could do. The emails kept coming, each one more menacing than the last. I felt like I was being watched, like someone was always lurking just out of sight, waiting for me to let my guard down. I started to avoid going out alone always looking over my shoulder and jumping at the slightest sound. But no matter how careful I was, the emails kept coming, each one more threatening than the last. They knew everything about me, my fears, my weaknesses, even my deepest secrets. I began to feel like I was losing my mind, like I was trapped in a nightmare with no way out. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't focus on anything but the constant stream of messages flooding my inbox. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I started receiving packages, packages filled with photographs, newspaper clippings, even items from my own apartment. It was like whoever was behind the emails was trying to drive me insane, to break me down until there was nothing left but fear and paranoia. I knew I had to do something, had to find out who was behind the emails before it was too late. But every time I tried to investigate, I had a dead end, there were no clues, no leads, nothing to point me in the right direction. I was running out of options, running out of time. I felt like I was drowning, suffocating under the weight of my own fear and desperation. But then, just when I was about to give up hope, I received a breakthrough, a message from the anonymous sender, taunting me with details about my past, my family, even my childhood. It was like a slap in the face, a wake-up call that snapped me out of my despair and into action. 
I knew I had to confront whoever was behind the emails, had to put an end to this nightmare once and for all. I gathered up all the evidence I had collected, all the emails, photos, and packages, and marched down to the police station, determined to make them listen. At first, they were skeptical, dismissing my claims as the paranoid ramblings of a disturbed mind. But as I laid out the evidence before them, their expressions changed from disbelief to concern. They promised to launch a full investigation, to track down whoever was behind the emails and bring them to justice. And for the first time in weeks, I allowed myself to hope, hope that I could finally put an end to this nightmare and reclaim my life. Days turned into weeks, and still, there was no sign of the anonymous sender. The police did their best, but without any concrete leads, there was little they could do. I began to lose hope, to feel like I was fighting a losing battle against an enemy I couldn't see or touch. But then, just when I was about to give up, I received a message, not from the anonymous sender, but from the police. They had traced the emails back to an old acquaintance of mine, someone I hadn't spoken to in years. It was like a punch in the gut, a betrayal that cut me to the core. But as the shock wore off, I realized that I finally had the answers I had been searching for. I confronted the acquaintance, demanding to know why they had targeted me, why they had tried to ruin my life. And as they confessed to their crimes, I felt a sense of relief wash over me, relief that I could finally put this nightmare behind me and move on with my life. The police arrested the acquaintance, and as they were led away in handcuffs, I felt a sense of closure that I hadn't felt in weeks. I knew that it would take time to heal from the trauma of the experience. I'm a bit of an outdoors enthusiast, always looking for new adventures and experiences. Last summer, I decided to go foraging for edible plants in the woods near my home. It was something I had done many times before, so I didn't think much of it as I set out into the forest, basket in hand. As I wandered deeper into the woods, I stumbled upon something unexpected, a hidden shrine nestled among the trees. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before surrounded by strange symbols and adorned with offerings of flowers and feathers. Intrigued, I approached the shrine cautiously, my curiosity getting the better of me. I reached out to touch one of the symbols, and that's when it happened a sudden rush of cold air swept through the clearing, sending a shiver down my spine. I knew then that I had awakened something, something ancient and malevolent that had been lying dormant for centuries. And as I stood there, frozen in fear, I could feel its presence closing in on me, like a predator stalking its prey. I tried to run, to escape the clutches of whatever dark force I had unleashed, but it was no use. Everywhere I turned, I felt its eyes upon me, watching, waiting, biding its time until it was ready to strike. I stumbled through the underbrush, my heart pounding in my chest as I struggled to find a way out of the woods. But no matter how fast I ran or how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being hunted, that I was nothing more than prey to whatever lurked in the shadows. And then, just when I thought all hope was lost, I stumbled upon a clearing in the woods, bathed in the soft glow of the setting sun. It was like a beacon of light in the darkness, a sign that maybe, just maybe, there was still a chance for me to escape. I ran towards the clearing, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I raced towards the safety of open space. And as I burst through the trees and into the open air, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. But my relief was short-lived, as I soon realized that the danger was far from over. I could still feel the malevolent force lurking in the shadows, watching me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I knew then that I had to keep moving, to put as much distance between myself and the woods as possible. So I ran, faster and faster, until my legs burned and my lungs ached with exhaustion. And then, finally, just when I thought I couldn't run any further, I stumbled upon the edge of the forest, the safety of civilization just within reach. I collapsed onto the ground, gasping for breath as I looked back at the woods behind me, praying that whatever had been hunting me wouldn't follow. 
But as I lay there, catching my breath and trying to process what had just happened, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped something truly terrifying. I've always loved cooking. There's something therapeutic about chopping vegetables, stirring sauces, and creating delicious meals from scratch. So when I got the opportunity to spend a weekend alone in a cozy mountain cabin to test out recipes for an upcoming menu, I jumped at the chance. The cabin was nestled deep in the heart of the mountains, surrounded by towering pine trees and breathtaking views of the wilderness. It was the perfect setting for a culinary adventure far away from the hustle and bustle of city life. The first day passed without incident. I spent hours experimenting in the kitchen, trying out new flavor combinations and techniques. But as the sun began to set and darkness descended over the mountains, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled over me like a heavy blanket. I chalked it up to my overactive imagination, the product of spending too much time alone in the wilderness. But as I prepared to turn in for the night, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, as if someone, or something, was lurking just beyond the edge of the forest. That night, as I lay in bed listening to the sounds of the forest outside, I heard it, the unmistakable sound of pots and pans clanging together in the kitchen. At first, I dismissed it as just the wind or a trick of my imagination, but as the noise grew louder and more persistent, I couldn't ignore it any longer. Heart pounding in my chest, I crept out of bed and made my way to the kitchen, my footsteps echoing loudly in the silence of the cabin. The door creaked open, and I peered inside, half expecting to see an intruder rummaging through my pots and pans. But to my horror, the kitchen was empty, the only sound the faint hum of the refrigerator and the soft patter of rain against the windows. I blinked, convinced that I must have imagined it but the memory of those clanging pots and pans lingered in my mind like a bad dream. Shaken but determined to prove to myself that it was just my imagination, I searched the kitchen from top to bottom, checking every cupboard and drawer for any sign of an intruder. But aside from the usual assortment of cooking utensils and ingredients, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I tried to convince myself that it was just the wind or a trick of my mind, but deep down, I knew that something wasn't right. With a sense of growing unease, I returned to bed, but sleep eluded me, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. The next day, I tried to put the incident out of my mind and focus on my cooking. But as the day wore on and night fell once again, the feeling of unease returned, stronger than ever. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard it again, the sound of pots and pans clanging together in the kitchen. This time, there was no mistaking it, the noise was loud and clear, echoing through the cabin like a death knell. Heart pounding in my chest, I forced myself to get out of bed and investigate. But as I reached the kitchen door, a sudden sense of dread washed over me, like a wave crashing against the shore. With trembling hands, I pushed open the door and stepped inside, half expecting to come face to face with some unseen intruder. But once again, the kitchen was empty, the only sound the soft hum of the refrigerator and the distant howl of the wind. I searched the kitchen from top to bottom, desperate for any sign of an intruder, but there was nothing, no sign of forced entry, no footprints in the mud outside, nothing to indicate that anyone else had been there. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realized that I was alone in the cabin, surrounded by nothing but darkness and the echoing sound of my own footsteps. Terrified but determined to get to the bottom of the mystery, I resolved to stay awake until morning, keeping watch over the cabin and waiting for any sign of the intruder's return. But as the night dragged on and sleep continued to elude me, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something sinister was lurking just beyond the edge of the forest, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Exhausted and afraid, I spent the rest of the night huddled in bed, listening to the sounds of the forest outside and praying for the first light of dawn to break through the darkness. And when morning finally came, I packed my bags and fled the cabin, desperate to escape whatever unseen horror lurked within its walls. To this day, I still don't know what, or who, 
was responsible for the mysterious cleaning pots and pans in the kitchen. We were out on a canoeing trip down a remote river, seeking adventure and a break from the monotony of everyday life. The sun was shining, the water was calm, and everything seemed perfect as we paddled along, laughing and joking with each other. But as we rounded a bend in the river, we encountered a series of deadly rapids, swirling currents, jagged rocks, and treacherous obstacles that threatened to capsize our canoes at any moment. We paddled frantically, trying to steer clear of the most dangerous parts of the rapids, but it was no use. One by one, we were tossed about by the churning waters, our canoes spinning out of control as we struggled to stay afloat. And then, just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, one of our group went missing, swept away by the raging river before we could even react. Panic set in as we realized that our friend was in serious danger, lost somewhere in the treacherous rapids with no way for us to reach him. We called out his name, searching desperately for any sign of him amid the swirling waters, but he was gone, swallowed up by the river's merciless embrace. Fear crept us as we realized that we were not the only ones navigating the river's dangers. There was something else out there, something lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike when we least expected it. We paddled on, our hearts pounding in our chests as we tried to outrun whatever unseen threat was stalking us from the depths of the river. But no matter how fast we paddled, we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that unseen eyes were following our every move from the darkness of the riverbanks. And then, just when we thought we couldn't take it anymore, we heard the sound of branches snapping behind us, followed by the unmistakable sound of footsteps approaching. We froze, our hearts pounding in our chests as we turned to face whatever was coming towards us, praying that it wasn't the same fate that had befallen our missing friend. And then, emerging from the trees, we saw him, a man, wild-eyed and disheveled, with a look of madness in his eyes that sent shivers down our spines. We tried to paddle away, to escape, but he was faster, stronger than we could have ever imagined. He grabbed hold of our canoe, pulling us towards the riverbank with a strength that was inhuman. We struggled against his grip, fighting for our lives as he dragged us towards a secluded clearing hidden deep in the woods. And then, just when we thought all hope was lost, we saw a glimmer of something in the distance, the faint glow of a campfire, flickering in the darkness. We knew then that we had to escape, to break free from our captor before it was too late. So, we mustered up every ounce of strength we had left and fought back with everything we had, lashing out at him with all our might. And miraculously, it worked, he stumbled backwards giving us just enough time to break free and paddle towards the safety of the campfire. As we stumbled into the clearing, gasping for breath, we realized that we were not alone. There were other campers there, people who had been drawn to the warmth and light of the fire just as we had. We collapsed to the ground, exhausted and shaking, but relieved to be alive, to have escaped the clutches of our would-be attacker. I was working the graveyard shift at the gas station, just like any other night. It was quiet, with only the occasional car passing through, their headlights slicing through the darkness as they made their way along the deserted highway. But then, I noticed something strange, a car parked at the pumps, its engine running, but no driver in sight. I frowned, wondering if maybe they had gone inside to pay or use the restroom. I stepped out from behind the counter and made my way over to the car, my heart pounding in my chest as I peered inside. What I saw made my blood run cold, the driver was slumped over the steering wheel, their eyes wide open and unseeing. I reached out to touch their shoulder, but pulled back at the last moment, a sense of unease washing over me. Something wasn't right here, and I didn't want to get any closer than I had to. I hesitated for a moment, unsure of what to do. Should I call the police? Wake them up and see if they're okay? Or just leave them be and hope they wake up on their own? But then, I noticed something else, 
A strange smell emanating from the car. Something sickly sweet and metallic, like copper mixed with rotting fruit. It made my stomach churn, and I knew I couldn't just leave them there like that. I reached for my phone, my fingers trembling as I dialed 911 and explained the situation to the operator. They assured me that help was on the way and told me to stay put until the police arrived. I hung up the phone and took a step back from the car, feeling a sense of relief wash over me. But it was short-lived, as I heard a low, guttural growl coming from somewhere nearby. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to listen for any sign of movement. But all I could hear was the sound of my own ragged breathing and the distant hum of the highway. I told myself it was just my imagination, that there was nothing out there in the darkness waiting to get me. But deep down, I knew better, I could feel it, lurking just beyond the edge of my vision, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I glanced around nervously, searching for any sign of movement in the shadows. But all I could see was the empty expanse of the gas station parking lot, bathed in the harsh glow of the overhead lights. I shook my head, trying to shake off the feeling of unease that gripped me. I was just being paranoid, I told myself. There was nothing out there, nothing to be afraid of. But then, I heard it again, the low, guttural growl, closer this time, followed by the sound of heavy footsteps crunching on gravel. I felt a cold sweat break out on my skin as I realized that whatever was out there wasn't human. It was something else, something far more dangerous, and it was coming for me. I glanced back at the car, wondering if maybe I should hide inside until help arrived. But then, I remembered the driver, still slumped over the steering wheel, their eyes wide open and unseeing. I knew I couldn't just leave them there, not with whatever was out there lurking in the darkness. So, I made a split-second decision and ran back inside the gas station, locking the door behind me. I grabbed a baseball bat from behind the counter, my hands trembling as I waited for the police to arrive. But as the minutes ticked by, it felt like an eternity and I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that gnawed at my insides. And then, just when I thought all hope was lost, I heard the sound of sirens in the distance, growing closer and closer with each passing moment. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that help was finally on the way. But then, I heard something else, a loud crash as something slammed into the front door of the gas station, followed by the sound of shattering glass. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I realized that whatever was out there had found a way inside. I gripped the baseball bat tighter in my hands, ready to defend myself against whatever horrors lay beyond the door. But as I braced myself for the worst, the door swung open and a flood of light spilled into the room, revealing a group of police officers standing on the other side. I let out a sigh of relief, dropping the baseball bat to the ground as I rushed forward to greet them. They quickly took control of the situation, securing the gas station and ensuring that I was safe. As they led me outside, I couldn't help but glance back at the car, still parked at the pumps with the engine running. But the driver was nowhere to be seen, their fate a mystery that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I moved to a small town a few weeks ago, seeking a fresh start after a messy breakup. One day, while exploring the woods near my new home, I stumbled upon an ancient cemetery tucked away among the trees. Intrigued, I decided to take a closer look. As I walked among the weathered headstones, I felt a sense of unease settle over me. The atmosphere in the cemetery was heavy, oppressive like the weight of centuries of sorrow and loss bearing down on my shoulders. I was about to turn back when I spotted a figure standing near the edge of the cemetery. He was an older man, dressed in worn overalls and a tattered flannel shirt, with a weather-beaten face and a stern expression. I approached him cautiously, unsure of what to expect. When I asked if he was the groundskeeper, he nodded curtly, his eyes fixed on mine with an intensity that made me shiver. I tried to make small talk, asking him about the history of the cemetery and the people buried there. 
but his responses were short and cryptic, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about him. As we talked, I noticed that his gaze kept drifting to a particular gravestone, a crumbling, moss-covered monument that seemed to loom over us like a silent sentinel. When I asked him about it, his expression grew dark, and he muttered something about it being best to leave the dead to rest in peace. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I pushed aside my unease and pressed him for more information. That's when things took a turn for the worse. The groundskeeper's demeanor changed in an instant, his eyes narrowing as he fixed me with a cold, calculating stare. He stepped closer, his voice low and menacing as he warned me to leave the cemetery and never come back. I tried to protest, to ask him why he was so adamant about keeping me away. But before I could say another word, he lunged at me, his hands grabbing for my throat with a strength that belied his age. I stumbled backward, my heart pounding in my chest as I struggled to break free from his grasp. But he was relentless, his fingers digging into my skin like iron claws as he pressed me further and further toward the edge of the cemetery. In a blind panic, I managed to break free and sprinted toward the tree line, the sound of the groundskeeper's laughter echoing in my ears like a sinister taunt. I didn't stop running until I was safely back in town my lungs burning and my heart racing with fear. I didn't tell anyone about what happened in the cemetery, not the police, not my friends, not even my therapist. I was afraid they wouldn't believe me, that they would dismiss it as a figment of my imagination or the delusions of a troubled mind. But I know what I saw, what I felt, what I experienced that day in the woods. I'm an elderly man living in a retirement home, and I've seen my fair share of strange things over the years. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened one night when I was left alone in my room after visiting hours ended. As I drifted off to sleep, I felt a sense of unease settling over me, like someone was watching me from the shadows. I tried to shake off the feeling, telling myself that it was just my imagination running wild in the darkness. But then, as if on cue, I woke up to find a figure standing at the foot of my bed, their silhouette illuminated by the soft glow of the night light. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I stared at the intruder in shock. They stood perfectly still, their features obscured by the darkness as they watched me with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. For a moment, I was too terrified to move, too paralyzed by fear to even call out for help. But then, with a surge of adrenaline, I mustered up the courage to speak. Who are you? I demanded, my voice trembling with fear as I confronted the mysterious figure. But to my horror, they didn't respond. Instead, they continued to stare at me with an unnerving intensity, their presence filling the room with an oppressive sense of dread. I knew I had to do something, to take action before it was too late. With a shaky hand, I reached for the call button beside my bed, praying that someone would come to my rescue. But even as I pressed the button, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was completely alone, that there was no one out there who could save me from whatever lurked in the darkness. Minutes passed like hours as I waited for help to arrive, the figure at the foot of my bed never once moving from their spot. It was as if they were rooted to the spot, their gaze fixed on me with a chilling intensity. And then, just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, the door to my room burst open, flooding the room with light as a nurse rushed into my aid. She found me trembling in bed, my eyes wide with fear as I pointed to the figure at the foot of my bed. But when she turned to look, there was nothing there, just an empty space where the intruder had been standing moments before. I tried to explain what had happened, to tell her about the mysterious figure that had appeared in my room. But she just chalked it up to a bad dream, a trick of the imagination brought on by the stress of being alone in the dark. But I knew better. I knew that what I had seen was real, that there was something lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike when I least expected it. From that night on, I made sure to keep the lights on at all times, to banish the darkness and the things that lurked within it.
It was supposed to be a simple adventure. Just a group of college students heading out to explore a remote area of the woods rumored to be haunted. We heard the stories, of course tales of strange happenings and unexplained disappearances, but we didn't really believe them. We were young and fearless, eager to test our mettle against whatever mysteries the forest held. As we made our way deeper into the woods, the atmosphere grew increasingly eerie. The trees seemed to close in around us, casting long shadows that danced in the dim light filtering through the canopy above. Every rustle of leaves and snap of twigs set our nerves on edge, but we pressed on, determined to uncover the truth behind the legends. It wasn't long before we began to notice strange things happening around us. Shadows flitted through the trees just out of sight, and eerie whispers seemed to echo on the wind. We tried to laugh it off, chalking it up to our overactive imaginations, but deep down, we knew that something wasn't right. As night fell, the forest took on a whole new level of terror. The darkness seemed to swallow us whole, and we stumbled through the underbrush, our flashlights barely illuminating the path ahead. It felt like we were being watched, like unseen eyes were following our every move. Then, without warning, one of our group disappeared. One moment he was there, walking beside us, and the next he was gone, swallowed up by the darkness. We called out for him, searching frantically through the trees, but there was no sign of him anywhere. Fear gripped us like a vice as we realized that we were not alone in the woods. Whatever was out there, it was dangerous, and it was hunting us. We tried to stick together, to stay close and watch each other's backs, but the forest seemed to conspire against us, leading us in circles and driving us deeper into its dark heart. Hours passed, and still, we found no sign of our missing friend. Desperation nodded our insides as we struggled to come to terms with the fact that we might never find him. But just as we were about to give up hope, we stumbled upon a clearing in the woods. At first, it seemed like a sanctuary, a brief respite from the oppressive darkness of the forest. But as we stepped into the clearing, we realized that we had walked straight into the heart of the horror. The crown was littered with strange symbols, and a chill wind whispered through the trees, carrying with it the faint scent of decay. We knew then that we had stumbled upon something truly sinister, something that no amount of bravery could hope to overcome. But despite our fear, we couldn't turn back now. We had to find our friend, no matter what it took. We searched the clearing with growing dread, our flashlights casting long shadows that seemed to dance and twist in the darkness. And then, just when we were about to give up hope, we heard it a faint cry for help, coming from somewhere deep in the woods. Without hesitation, we followed the sound, pushing through the underbrush with renewed determination. And then, there he was, our missing friend, battered and bruised but alive. We rushed to his side, pulling him to his feet and helping him to safety. As we made our way out of the woods, our hearts pounding in our chests, we couldn't help but wonder what horrors lurked in the darkness behind us. But one thing was for certain, we would never forget the terror of that night, or the strength of the bonds that had helped us to survive. I was doing my rounds as usual, working the night shift at the animal shelter. It was a quiet night, with only the sound of the occasional bark or meow breaking the silence. As I made my way through the rows of cages, checking on the animals and making sure they were comfortable, I heard a faint scratching sound coming from the isolation ward. At first, I thought it was just one of the animals trying to get out of its cage. But as I listened closer, the sound seemed more deliberate, more purposeful, like someone or something was trying to get my attention. My heart began to race as I approached the isolation ward, my footsteps echoing loudly in the empty hallway. The scratching grew louder with each step, sending shivers down my spine. I reached the door to the isolation ward and hesitated for a moment, my hand hovering over the handle. I didn't know what to expect on the other side, but I knew I had to find out. With a deep breath, I pushed open the door and stepped inside. 
The room was dimly lit, with only a few flickering fluorescent lights casting eerie shadows on the walls. And that's when I saw it, a figure hunched over one of the cages, its back turned to me as it continued to scratch at the metal bars. I froze in place, my heart pounding in my chest as I watched the intruder. Who could it be? What were they doing here? I took a step closer, my hand reaching for the light switch on the wall. But before I could flick it on, the figure suddenly stopped scratching and turned towards me. In the dim light, I could see its eyes glinting in the darkness, cold and calculating. My blood ran cold as I realized that this was no ordinary intruder. I backed away slowly, my heart hammering in my chest as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. Who or what was this person, and why were they here in the isolation ward? But before I could think of an answer, the figure lunged towards me, its hands reaching out as if to grab me. I stumbled backwards, my heart racing as I tried to dodge out of the way. I managed to duck behind one of the cages, my breath coming in short, ragged gasps as I tried to calm myself down. But the figure was relentless, its footsteps echoing loudly in the empty room as it searched for me. I knew I had to get out of there, to find help before it was too late. With a burst of adrenaline, I bolted towards the door, my heart pounding in my chest as I prayed that it would open. To my relief, it did, and I stumbled out into the hallway my lungs burning as I ran for my life. I could hear the figure following close behind, its footsteps growing louder with each passing second. But I refused to look back, refused to let fear consume me. I just kept running, my legs pumping as fast as they could go until I reached the safety of the main office. I slammed the door shut behind me, my chest heaving as I leaned against it, trying to catch my breath. I was safe for now, but I knew that the figure was still out there, still lurking in the darkness, waiting for its next opportunity to strike. I knew I had to warn someone to get help before it was too late. With trembling hands, I reached for the phone on the desk and dialed 911, my voice shaking as I tried to explain what had happened. The operator listened patiently as I recounted my harrowing encounter, promising to send help right away. But even as I hung up the phone, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me like a dark cloud. I knew that the figure was still out there, still waiting in the shadows for its next victim. It all started innocently enough. I was driving home from work my mind preoccupied with the usual worries and stresses of daily life. But as I glanced in the rearview mirror, I noticed a car following me, a beat-up old sedan, its headlights glaring in the darkness. At first, I didn't think much of it. Maybe they were just going the same way I was, I thought to myself. But as I turned onto a side street, the car followed, its presence growing more ominous with each passing moment. I tried to shake them off, taking a series of random turns and detours in the hopes of losing them, but no matter what I did, they stayed right behind me, like a shadow that refused to be shaken. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized I was being followed, stalked by someone who seemed to know everything about me, where I lived, where I worked, even my daily routines. I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead as I tried to think of what to do next. Should I call the police? drive to the nearest police station? Or would that just make things worse? In the end, I decided to keep driving, hoping against hope that I could somehow lose them and make it home safely. But as the minutes turned into hours and the miles stretched on, it became increasingly clear that they weren't going to let me go without a fight. I tried to stay calm, to focus on the road ahead and ignore the creeping sense of dread that threatened to overwhelm me. But with each passing moment, it became harder and harder to ignore the feeling that I was being watched, that every move I made was being scrutinized and analyzed by someone lurking in the shadows. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I realized that the car following me wasn't just any car, it was my own car, the same make and model, right down to the license plate. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized the implications of what I was seeing. 
Whoever was following me wasn't just some random stalker. They were someone who knew me, someone who had access to my personal information and was using it against me. I tried to think of who it could be, an ex-boyfriend, a disgruntled co-worker, a stranger with a grudge, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't come up with a single person who fit the bill. And then, just as suddenly as they had appeared, the car vanished into thin air, leaving me alone on the deserted road. I sat there for a moment, stunned and shaken, before gathering my wits and driving home as fast as I could. When I got home, I locked all the doors and windows and called the police, but there was little they could do without any evidence. They promised to keep an eye out for any suspicious activity, but I knew deep down that I was on my own. I spent the rest of the night huddled in my bed, too terrified to sleep, my mind racing with thoughts of who could have been stalking me and why. In the end, I never did find out who it was or why they were following me. I rented this secluded cottage in the woods to focus on my writing, to find inspiration in the peace and quiet of nature. But last night, something happened that shook me to my core, something that I still can't quite explain. It was late, well past midnight, and I was sitting at my desk, lost in the world of my novel. That's when I heard it, the sound of footsteps on the stairs leading up to the attic. At first, I brushed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me, but then I heard it again, louder this time, more distinct. My heart pounding in my chest, I slowly made my way to the staircase, my hand trembling as I reached for the banister. With each step I took, the sound of the footsteps grew louder, echoing through the silent house like a drumbeat. I reached the top of the stairs and pushed open the door to the attic, my breath catching in my throat as I peered into the darkness. And that's when I saw him, a strange man standing in the shadows, his eyes gleaming in the dim light. For a moment, we just stood there, staring at each other in silence. And then, without a word, he turned and disappeared into the darkness, leaving me alone in the attic, my heart racing, my mind spinning with fear and confusion. I didn't know what to do. Should I call the police? Should I pack up and leave? But before I could make a decision, I heard the sound of footsteps again, this time coming from the stairs leading down to the main floor. My heart in my throat, I crept down the stairs, my eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. And that's when I saw him, the same man, coming down from the attic, his footsteps echoing through the silent house like a death knell. I knew I had to get out of there, to escape before it was too late. With trembling hands, I grabbed my phone and my keys, my heart pounding in my chest as I made my way to the front door. But just as I reached for the handle, I heard a voice behind me, the man's voice, cold and menacing, sending chills down my spine. Where do you think you're going, he said, his words dripping with malice. I didn't answer. I didn't dare to turn around. I just grabbed the handle and flung the door open, running out into the night, my heart racing, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I didn't stop running until I reached the main road, where I flagged down a passing car and begged the driver to take me to the nearest police station. I told them everything, about the cottage, about the strange man in the attic, about the terror that had consumed me. The police launched an investigation, but they never found any sign of the man or any evidence that he had ever been there. Some of them even suggested that I had imagined the whole thing, that it was just a figment of my overactive imagination. But I know what I saw. I know what I heard. And I'll never forget the fear that consumed me that night. I'm an artist, and like many artists, I sometimes find myself in need of inspiration. So, when I hit a creative block a few months ago, I decided to retreat to a secluded cabin in the woods. I thought the peace and quiet would help me focus on my work and hopefully get the creative juices flowing again. The cabin was nestled deep in the heart of the forest, 
surrounded by towering trees and the sounds of nature. It was the perfect place to escape from the hustle and bustle of everyday life and immerse myself in my art. At first, everything seemed perfect. I spent my days painting and sketching, losing myself in the beauty of the natural world around me. But as the days went on, I began to notice something strange. I would catch glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, fleeting shadows darting among the trees. At first, I brushed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me, but as time went on, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something lurking just beyond the edge of the forest, something dark and malevolent that was watching my every move. One night, as I sat alone in the cabin, working on a particularly challenging piece, I heard a sound outside, a low, guttural crawl that sent a shiver down my spine. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to listen for any sign of movement outside. For what felt like an eternity, there was nothing but silence, broken only by the sound of my own ragged breathing. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the crawling stopped, leaving me alone in the darkness once more. I tried to convince myself that it was just an animal passing through the woods, but deep down, I knew better. There was something out there, something that didn't belong in the forest, and it was watching me. As the days passed, the sense of unease grew stronger, until it felt like I was being suffocated by the weight of it. I couldn't focus on my art, couldn't sleep at night for fear of what might be lurking just beyond the trees. I considered leaving packing up my things and retreating back to the safety of civilization, but something held me back. I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever was out there was connected to my art, that it was somehow drawing me closer to it. And so, against my better judgment, I stayed, determined to confront whatever lurked in the darkness and reclaim my sense of peace. One night, as I sat alone in the cabin, the feeling of being watched grew stronger than ever. I could sense a presence just beyond the edge of the forest, waiting, watching, biding its time. I knew then that I couldn't wait any longer. I had to confront whatever was out there and put an end to this nightmare once and for all. Armed with nothing but a flashlight and my courage, I ventured out into the darkness, my heart pounding in my chest as I crept through the underbrush. As I reached the edge of the forest, I heard it the sound of footsteps crunching on the forest floor growing louder and louder with each passing moment. And then, suddenly, it was there, standing before me in the darkness, a shadowy figure, its eyes burning with an otherworldly light. I didn't stop to think, didn't hesitate for even a second. With a scream of terror, I turned and ran, my feet pounding against the forest floor as I raced back to the safety of the cabin. I don't know how long I ran, how far I went before I finally collapsed onto the ground, gasping for breath and shaking with fear. But when I finally gathered the courage to look back, the figure was gone, vanished into the darkness like a ghost. I stayed in the cabin for the rest of the night, too terrified to venture back out into the woods. But when morning came, I knew I had to leave, to put as much distance between myself and whatever had been lurking in the darkness. And so, with my heart still racing and my hands shaking, I packed up my things and fled from the cabin, vowing never to return to that cursed place again. I was driving down a lonely stretch of road, the headlights of my car cutting through the darkness like a knife. It was late and I was eager to reach my destination, but the rain was coming down in sheets, making it difficult to see more than a few feet in front of me. Suddenly, above the roar of the storm, I heard a voice calling out for help. It was faint at first, barely audible over the sound of the rain, but as I drew closer, it grew louder and more desperate. Without thinking, I slowed to a stop, my heart pounding in my chest as I scanned the darkness for the source of the voice. And then I saw her, standing by the side of the road, her figure illuminated by the glow of my headlights. She was young and beautiful, with long dark hair and eyes that seemed to shine with an otherworldly light. She was waving her arms frantically, 
her voice rising to a panicked shriek as she begged me to help her. Without hesitation, I flung open the door of my car and stepped out into the rain, my only thought to offer assistance to someone in need. But as I approached her, a sense of unease began to creep over me, like a cold hand closing around my heart. There was something about her, something in the way she moved, that set off alarm bells in the back of my mind. But before I could turn and run, she lunged at me with surprising speed, her hands reaching out to grab me in a vice-like grip. I tried to fight her off, to break free from her grasp, but she was stronger than she looked, her fingers digging into my flesh like talons. With a surge of adrenaline, I managed to break free from her grip and stumble backwards, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to catch my breath. But as I looked up, I realized that I was now alone. There were others emerging from the darkness, their faces twisted into grotesque masks of rage and hunger. I knew then that I had stumbled into a trap, that the woman by the side of the road was not in need of help, but was instead a lure used by some cunning predator to ensnare unsuspecting victims. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I turned and ran, my only thought to escape with my life. But they were relentless in their pursuit, their footsteps echoing through the night like the approach of some ancient evil. I ran as fast as I could, my lungs burning with exertion, but no matter how hard I tried, I could not shake them off my trail. Just when I thought I couldn't run any further, I saw the lights of a passing car up ahead, and with a surge of hope, I redoubled my efforts, pushing myself to the brink of exhaustion. The car drew closer, its headlights cutting through the darkness like a beacon of salvation, and I knew that my only chance of survival lay in reaching it before it was too late. With one final burst of energy, I threw myself towards the car, my fingers scrabbling desperately at the door handle. And then, just as I felt the hands of my pursuers closing in around me, the door swung open, and I tumbled inside, my heart pounding in my chest as the car sped away into the night. I went on a solo camping trip, seeking solace in the quiet of the wilderness, but what I found was far from peaceful. From the moment I arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, as if someone, or something, was lurking in the shadows, just beyond my line of sight. As night fell and darkness descended upon the forest, my paranoia only intensified. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of twigs, sent shivers down my spine, and I found myself jumping at the slightest sound. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, that there was nothing out there but the trees and the animals, but deep down, I knew that something wasn't right. I built a fire, hoping that the warmth and light would keep whatever was out there at bay, but it offered little comfort as I huddled close, scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard it, a low, guttural crawl echoing through the trees, sending chills down my spine. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to listen for any other sounds, but all I heard was the eerie silence of the forest at night. I tried to tell myself that it was just an animal, but something about the sound didn't sit right with me. It was too deep, too menacing, like nothing I had ever heard before. I considered packing up and leaving, but the thought of wandering through the dark woods alone was almost as terrifying as whatever was out there, so I stayed put clinging to the dwindling hope that it would all just go away. But as the hours passed and the fire burned low, my fear only grew stronger. Every shadow seemed to take on a life of its own, every rustle of leaves a potential threat. I didn't sleep that night, too afraid of what might happen if I let my guard down even for a moment. I sat by the fire, my eyes trained on the darkness, waiting for dawn to break and the nightmare to end. And then, finally, the first light of dawn began to creep over the horizon, casting long shadows across the forest floor. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that I had made it through the night in one piece. But as I began to pack up my things and prepare to leave, I heard it again, that same guttural growl, closer this time, followed by the sound of heavy footsteps crunching through the underbrush. 
I turned to see a figure emerging from the trees, shrouded in darkness and moving with an unnatural grace that sent alarm bells ringing in my head. I didn't wait around to see what it was. I grabbed my pack and ran, sprinting through the forest as fast as my legs would carry me, desperate to escape whatever lurked behind me. I didn't stop running until I reached the safety of my car, heart pounding in my chest and lungs burning with exertion. And as I drove away from the cursed campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped something truly sinister, something that lurked in the darkness and watched me with hungry eyes. I never went camping alone again, haunted by the memory of that night and the terrifying realization that I was now alone in the wilderness. It was just another typical night at the dive bar where I worked as a bartender. The usual crowd of regulars was there, drowning their sorrows in cheap beer and whiskey, while the jukebox blared out classic rock tunes in the background. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something strange, a group of strangers sitting in the corner booth, their faces hidden in the shadows. At first, I didn't think much of it. After all, it wasn't uncommon for shady characters to come through the doors of the bar. But as the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about them. They never spoke, never laughed, never even touched their drinks. They just sat there, staring straight ahead with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. I tried to ignore them, to focus on the other patrons at the bar. But every time I glanced over at the booth, I felt a sense of dread creeping over me, like something terrible was about to happen. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any stranger, one of the strangers caught my eye. Their face was hidden in the shadows, but I could see their eyes, cold, lifeless, devoid of any emotion. I forced myself to look away, to concentrate on my work and pretend like everything was normal. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. There was something wrong with those people, something unnatural, and I didn't want to stick around to find out what it was. But then, as I was wiping down the bar, one of them got up and started walking towards me. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as they approached, their movements slow and deliberate. I tried to maintain my composure, to act like everything was fine. But inside, I was terrified, wondering what they wanted from me and if I would ever make it out of this alive. They finally reached the bar and leaned in close their breath hot against my ear as they whispered something that sent chills down my spine. I couldn't make out the words, but I could feel the menace in their voice, the threat hanging in the air like a dark cloud. I wanted to run, to scream for help, but I was frozen in place, unable to move as they stared at me with those cold, lifeless eyes. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard a commotion from the other side of the bar. I turned to see one of the other patrons standing up, a look of horror on their face as they pointed towards the strangers in the corner booth. I followed their gaze and felt my blood run cold as I saw what they were pointing at. The strangers were changing, their bodies contorting and twisting in ways that shouldn't be possible. I watched in horror as their skin peeled back, revealing something dark and twisted underneath. Their eyes glowed with an otherworldly light as they lunged forward their mouths opening impossibly wide to reveal rows of sharp, jagged teeth. I knew then that I had to get out of there, to escape before it was too late. I turned and ran for the back door, my heart pounding in my chest as I heard the sound of screams and chaos behind me. I burst out into the alley behind the bar and kept running, not stopping until I was far away from that place, far away from those things. I never went back to that dive bar again, and I never found out what happened to those strangers in the corner booth. But I'll never forget the terror I felt that night, the fear of knowing that there are things out there in the world that defy explanation. I stumbled upon something in my small town that I wish I hadn't. It all started innocently enough, just me going about my usual routine, 
running errands and grabbing coffee at the local cafe. But then one day, I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. I was walking past the old abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town when I saw a group of people sneaking inside. At first, I thought nothing of it, just some kids exploring or maybe some squatters looking for shelter. But then I noticed the way they were dressed, all in dark robes with hoods pulled up over their heads. My curiosity got the better of me, and I followed them inside, keeping to the shadows and trying to stay out of sight. What I saw there chilled me to the bone. There were candles flickering on every surface, casting eerie shadows on the walls, and in the center of the room, there was a circle drawn in chalk with strange symbols etched into the floor. I watched in horror as the group began to chant in a language I didn't recognize, their voices rising in intensity as they performed some kind of ritual. I wanted to run, to get as far away from there as possible, but something held me rooted to the spot, unable to tear my eyes away from the scene unfolding before me. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, they noticed me. One of them pointed in my direction, shouting something in a language I couldn't understand, and suddenly, I was surrounded. I tried to fight them off, to push my way through their ranks and escape, but there were too many of them, and they were too strong. They dragged me into the center of the circle, pinning me down as their leader stepped forward, a sinister smile playing on his lips. He whispered something in my ear, something that sent shivers down my spine, and then everything went black. When I woke up, I was lying on the cold, hard ground outside the warehouse, my head spinning and my body aching all over. I stumbled to my feet, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to make sense of what had just happened. But deep down, I knew that I couldn't stay in that town any longer, not with those people out there, lurking in the shadows and waiting to strike. I packed up my things and left, putting as much distance between myself and that place as possible. But even now, I can't shake the feeling that they're still out there, watching and waiting for me to slip up so they can finish what they started. So, I was driving alone on this long stretch of road, you know. It was late and I needed to stop for gas. I saw this old gas station up ahead, looked kinda sketchy, but it was the only one around for miles. So, I figured I didn't have much choice. Pulling in, I noticed something off right away. There were no other cars, no lights on inside, nothing. Usually, even in the middle of nowhere, you'd see some sign of life at a gas station, right? But this place was dead quiet. I got out of my car, feeling kinda uneasy. The air was thick with this weird silence, like it was pressing down on me. I walked up to the pump, but there was no sound when I squeezed the handle. No gas coming out. Looking around, I saw the store part of the station. It was all dark inside, but I could make out shelves stocked with stuff. I figured maybe someone was inside, so I went to check it out. The door creaked open when I pushed it, and I stepped inside. It smelled musty, like old grease and dust. There were aisles of snacks and drinks, but everything looked ancient, like it hadn't been touched in years. I called out, hello? Anyone here? But there was no answer, just the echo of my own voice bouncing off the walls. Feeling a shiver crawl up my spine, I started to back out of the store when I heard something. It was faint at first, like a whisper in the wind. But then it got louder, this low murmuring coming from somewhere in the back. I hesitated, not sure if I should investigate or just get the hell out of there. But curiosity got the better of me, and I followed the sound. The murmuring led me to a door at the back of the store. It was cracked open just a little, and I could see a sliver of light spilling out from inside. I pushed the door open slowly, trying not to make any noise. And what I saw inside, it still gives me chills just thinking about it. There were people in there, but they weren't moving. They were just standing in a circle, 
staring straight ahead with blank expressions on their faces. And in the center of the circle was this thing. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. It was tall and skinny, with long, spindly arms that reached out towards the ceiling. Its skin was pale and stretched tight over its bones, like it was wearing a suit that was too small for it. But the worst part was its face. It had no features, no eyes or mouth or nose. Just smooth, blank skin staring back at me. I wanted to run, to scream, but I was frozen in place. I couldn't tear my eyes away from it. And then it spoke, this raspy voice that sent shivers down my spine. Join us, it said, and I felt this overwhelming urge to step forward, to join the circle of people standing there like statues. But something inside me snapped then, and I turned and ran as fast as I could. I didn't stop until I was back in my car, driving away from the place as fast as the wheels would take me. I didn't look back, didn't stop until I was miles away. And even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still watching me, waiting for me to come back. I don't know what that thing was, or what it wanted from me. But I do know one thing. I'll never stop at a gas station in the middle of nowhere again. Living alone in a studio apartment can be peaceful, but sometimes it gets lonely. Last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep by the sound of knocking on my door. It was the middle of the night and I couldn't imagine who would be visiting at such an hour. I crockily got out of bed and stumbled to the door. Peering through the peephole, I saw a figure standing outside, a man wearing a mask. My heart skipped a beat as fear shot through me. Who was this person, and what did they want from me? Despite my apprehension, I cautiously unlocked the door and cracked it open slightly, keeping the chain lock in place. The man in the mask stood there, his features obscured by the darkness and the mask he wore. He spoke in a low, gravelly voice, his words barely audible over the pounding of my heart. He said he needed help, that he was lost and confused, and that he needed to come inside. But something about his demeanor set off alarm bells in my mind. There was a sense of menace in the air, a feeling that made my skin crawl and my instinct scream at me to stay away. I told him that I couldn't help him, that he needed to leave, but he refused to take no for an answer. He grew more insistent, banging on the door and demanding to be let in. Terrified, I slammed the door shut and locked it, my hands shaking as I backed away. I didn't know what to do, I was alone, with no one to turn to for help. For what felt like hours, I sat huddled in my apartment listening to the sound of the man pounding on the door and shouting threats at me from the other side. But eventually, the noise stopped, replaced by an eerie silence that hung heavy in the air. I cautiously approached the door and peered through the peephole, but the man was gone, vanished into the night without a trace. I breathed a sigh of relief, but the fear lingered, gnawing at the edges of my mind as I tried to make sense of what had just happened. I called the police and reported the incident, but there was little they could do without any evidence or leads. They advised me to stay inside and lock my doors, and to call them immediately if the man returned. I spent the rest of the night on edge, jumping at every sound and casting nervous glances at the door. Sleep was out of the question, every time I closed my eyes, I saw the man's masked face looming in the darkness, his threats echoing in my mind. When morning finally came, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The light of day brought with it a renewed sense of safety, and I vowed never to answer the door to strangers again. But as the days passed, the memory of that night lingered, haunting me like a shadow that refused to fade. I couldn't shake the feeling that the man in the mask was still out there, watching and waiting for his chance to strike again. I installed extra locks on my door and invested in a security system but the sense of unease never truly went away. Every time I heard a noise outside my apartment or caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure in the darkness, my heart would race and my palms would grow clammy with fear. 
but despite my fears, life went on. I continued with my studies, went to work, and tried to put the events of that night behind me. Months passed without incident, and I began to relax, telling myself that the man in the mask was nothing more than a figment of my imagination, a nightmare brought to life by fear and paranoia. What do you think? I was driving alone, relying on my GPS to guide me through unfamiliar territory. Everything seemed fine at first, but then things started to go wrong. The GPS led me down a series of increasingly isolated and desolate back roads, far away from civilization. At first, I didn't think much of it, glitches happen, right? But as the roads grew narrower and more treacherous, I started to feel a creeping sense of unease. I tried to ignore it, telling myself that I just needed to trust the GPS and keep following its instructions. But the roads it was leading me down were getting worse by the minute, winding through dense forests and steep hillsides with no sign of civilization in sight. I started to panic, wondering if I had made a mistake by relying on technology instead of my own instincts. But it was too late to turn back now, the GPS had me firmly in its grip leading me further and further into the unknown. As I drove on, the feeling of isolation only grew stronger. I felt like I was the only person in the world, surrounded by nothing but darkness and silence. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, disaster struck. The road ahead of me suddenly disappeared, replaced by a yawning chasm that seemed to stretch on forever. My heart pounding in my chest, I slammed on the brakes and skidded to a stop just inches from the edge. I sat there for what felt like an eternity, staring into the abyss and wondering how I was ever going to get out of this mess. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the chasm vanished, leaving me shaken but unarmed. I didn't waste any time getting out of there, putting as much distance between myself and that cursed road as possible. But even as I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still watching me, waiting for me to make another wrong turn. We were pumped up for our hiking trip, excited to spend some quality time in the great outdoors. Our group consisted of me, Sarah, and a few other friends. We had all the essentials packed, water, snacks, and a map. Or so we thought. As we trekked deeper into the mountains, the scenery became more breathtaking with each step. But as the day wore on, we realized we might have taken a wrong turn somewhere. The trail seemed to disappear into thin air, leaving us stranded in the wilderness with no idea which way to go. Panic started to set in as we frantically searched for any signs of the trail. The sun began its descent, casting long shadows across the forest floor. With darkness looming, tensions among us began to rise. Sarah, always the voice of reason, tried to keep us calm. But as the hours passed and the darkness closed in around us, even her optimism began to wane. We were lost, alone, and running out of options. The forest grew eerily quiet as night fell broken only by the sound of our footsteps crunching on the forest floor. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, sent shivers down our spines. We stumbled through the darkness, our flashlights casting feeble beams of light into the blackness ahead. Each step felt like a leap of faith, as if at any moment we could stumble into the unknown. Exhausted and terrified, we huddled together for warmth, hoping against hope that someone would come to our rescue. But as the night dragged on, it became clear that we were on our own. The darkness seemed to swallow us whole, enveloping us in its suffocating embrace. We were lost in a sea of trees, with no beacon to guide us home. As the hours ticked by, our fears grew more pronounced. Every shadow seemed to morph into something sinister, every sound an omen of impending doom. But just as we were on the brink of despair, 
a glimmer of hope appeared on the horizon. A faint glow in the distance, like a beacon calling us home. With renewed determination, we followed the light, stumbling over roots and rocks in our haste to escape the darkness. And as we emerged from the forest, blinking in the pale light of dawn, we realized that we had made it out alive. Relief washed over us like a tidal wave as we collapsed onto the ground, exhausted but grateful to be alive. And as we huddled together, basking in the warmth of the rising sun, we knew that we would never forget the terror of that night in the woods.